Okay, good morning and welcome to day three. We're halfway through. Um, if you would open up your supplemental documents notebook, our book to page three, we'll go over the questions from um, yesterday. Number three, what is a syllable? Um, remember Jamie gave you the hand signals yesterday that a syllable is a word or a part of a word with one vowel sound. And she also followed that up with younger children it often doesn't mean a lot to. Um, and I agree with that. I work with my first graders and I teach them that. They kind of look at me with the question mark like what? Can you hear back in the corner, Julie? Okay. Um, and so I always add the chin drop piece. So if we're saying um, the name Jamie, Jamie, and our chin drops two times. How many times does our chin drop? And we count that. Usually they've got their other fingers up going at the same time. That works well. Um, diagraph we did yesterday, blend, cluster. We did phoneme yesterday too, right? And grapheme? And morpheme? Or no? Did you talk about morphemes yesterday? No, no, no. All right, we'll hold off on morpheme. Um, let's go to number 11. In a one syllable word, right after one short vowel, we double the final letters F, L, S, and Z. And that's called the floss plus Z rule for the F, L, S, and then plus the Z. And it's to protect that short vowel. And then the spellings CK, TCH, and DGE are used at the end of a short word or a one syllable word right after a short vowel, and those are called short vowel protectors. And then yesterday, the three syllable patterns that we talked about were closed, open, and magic E. And we will continue with syllable patterns today. Okay, any questions from all of you? <coughs> nope. Any Zoom questions? Okay. What do you need up, Jamie? Um, Document camera? All righty, there we go. Okay. In a four-day training, today is Mini Thursday. Just remember that. <laughs> okay. I'm going to go over a, um, a blending drill, flexing between um, open and closed syllables and magic E. Except for I left my cards over here. Sorry. Uh, all right. Here is my blending deck. I'm going to be sorting them up here, so you really aren't going to see that. But once I'm, it, what it's important to know when you're sorting, and we kind of noticed when we went into some of the um, breakout rooms yesterday, you make sure to put the letters in the right place. Because if you have a Y at the end, that basically makes it, it messes you up because it makes a vowel team, or if you have a W at the end. So there's, make sure to look at the little boxes, and it tells you where you need to put those. If you make a mistake, that's okay. We all make mistakes, and we're just going to fix it, okay? Next time, I always go, oh, don't look at that. All right, first thing is, class, tell me what the vowels are. Ready? A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y. And what are all the other letters called? Consonants. Very good. I have one girl goes, conso, consonants. Like, <laughs> not quite, but. Okay, closed syllables. We've learned about closed syllables. They have one vowel, and what's going to be at the end of that syllable? A consonant, exactly. And what is the vowel going to say? It's name or it's sound? It's sound. It's sound. An open syllable, it ends in a vowel. And what is the vowel going to say? It's name. It's name. Good. We learned yesterday about the magic E syllable. And what does the magic E do? It jumps back 
one letter to make a vowel say its name. All right, two sounds, go. Now, this is going to go in the middle. Anything that starts with a vowel goes in the middle. Okay, and what do we say about that? We'll look at the back and go over it. If the ending sounds like V, always add a magic E. And we're just going to do an E. Yeah. Okay. So that will go at the beginning. Here we go. This is the floss rule, if you remember. Um, the floss rule is after one single vowel in a one syllable word, we double the final F when is heard. Yeah, we have to put that at the beginning. Very good. My kids, when they were in kindergarten, did something called the uh, letter people, and they always had a Q and U wedding. You know, yes. and you got to be picked to be the Q or the U to get married. But they certainly <laughs> always remember Q and U went together. So I thought that was cute. Okay, and we have the J, 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 J and we are going to say J, J is, is never ever an English, English word's last letter. letter. Oh. Ruh, very good. See, I forget to say the sound. Now I remember. Okay. Shh. And that has a saying too, in a one-syllable word with one short vowel, the ch at the end is where T C C H is found. Um, okay. Ink. 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 This has a saying as well. In a one-syllable word with a short vowel sound, the k at the end is where ck can be found. Um, we know that's a floss rule. We're not going to say it every time. Here we go. And that's the same thing, one syllable word with one short vowel, J at the end is where DGE is found. Uh, you. And now we know the other sound, U. Uh, you, U. Let's do it together. Uh, you, U. Ong. And Z. Okay. That's how you would do. A, uh, a visual drill and notice that I did it pretty quickly and you can get through it pretty quickly when they're used to the uh, the uh, procedure okay I'm gonna bring this up so you can see the whole blending drill and we're gonna start out with sound by sound to kind of get warmed up and then we're gonna go into whole word red because that's the desired um, situation all right, is everybody ready? Let's do sound by sound. V-A-B-V-A-B. W-A-B-W-A-B. Okay, the next one, let's do the whole thing. Fab. What is this? Fay. Fay, very good. Sab. Okay, now look at this, guys. We learned this yesterday. We're going to add old magic E over here. Save. Now let's say it. Save. Save. Very good. 
Cabe. Fabe. Very good. I'm going to put that to the side. What does this say? Fab. What does this say? Fab. Oops. I don't know. Jab. Jay. Jabe. Jan. Jan. Jane. Kane. Kane. Lane. Okay, what's the problem here? <laughs> we can't do this. So you make sure you co you cover everything. And this says long, 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 row, round, ron, fawn, phone. Real word, yay! Okay. Faha. Oh, ooh, real word. Notice I can't have an E over here because it can't, it can't jump over these three yellow letters. You are exactly right. Chug. I'm not going to show the magic E here because what would happen is that changes that sound. Until they learn that, we're not going to really do that. Well, they kind of learned it, but that's a higher level. So we're not going to do that. Just it muddies the waters. Okay, that's chug. 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 Chong, Wong. Okay, and that's the end of the blending drill. You don't have to go through all the cards, but if you see how I, I uh, flex between open, closed, and magic key in the blending drill and had them practice, you want them to become effortless. That leads to fluency. Okay. The next thing I'm going to talk about is R controlled, and R controlled. We'll zoom in. Um, this is S10, but you don't have to get it out, but this is another tool card, another supplementary deck card that you can use to talk about this. Um, this is the bossy R syllable, and we talk about how the R is so bossy it changes the sounds of the vowels, and it's a whole different sound. You could put this as a poster at the top, at the, at the front of your room, if you have a lot of wall space. I really don't have a lot of wall space. I guess I could put it on the ceiling or something. But <laughs> Anyway, um, so when we're ready, and we've talked about Crazy R before, because you, you might be talking about Crazy R when you're just talking um, and introducing the individual sounds, OK? And the individual sounds, um, but, uh, let me talk about the bossy R syllable. It says, when a vowel is followed by R is found, bossy R changes the vowel sound. The vowel is neither long nor short, like car or bird or surf or sport. Then I'm going to say, all right, class, we're going to learn about the bossy R syllable. The bossy R has what after it? I'm sorry. The vowel has what after it? R. R. An R, exactly. And the sound is neither long nor short. It's a whole different sound. And then I'm going to individually do the different sounds for the bossy R's. And I would not do them on the same day. 
and this is what the way that I would introduce them in this kind of this order um, three of them say er and they get very mixed up about that I would introduce ER most common um, first um, I always tell them it's most common if you're unsure use ER then I would do AR because it's a different sound then I do another er and then I would do OR because these two are different sounds and then I would do IR okay that's the order that I would do and introduce them and kind of spread it out so they don't get too, com too confused and then I would say and they know this very well ER says er as in fern so when I say how do you spell the er in fern they know how to spell it this UR says er as in surf and then this IR says er as in bird and the for me and for my kids what helps them the most is those keywords okay okay yes now there are picture deck cards that you could go through first with them and it has those pictures um, there's the fern ER says er as in fern AR says R as in car UR says er as in surf OR says or as in fork and IR says er as in bird okay so if you are introducing a word you want them to be very attached in this particular case to the key word so that they can get a picture every time I say to them in an auditory drill I would want you to like you to write down the er as in bird and that will come up the IR I would like you to write the er as in fern I would like you to write the er as in surf okay so those are the picture cards that you can use when you're introducing them and like I said it is a different kind of syllable an R controlled syllable um, that's why when we talk about um, we used to say at our school for magic E the lazy bossy E getting saying lazy bossy that bossy gets them mixed up with bossy R so that's why we changed to magic E it's magical so um, um, this is what you have to be careful of in a blending drill okay uh, let's see Um, here we go. Oh, I don't want that. Um, of course, here we go. Let's say that you put the, you have the bossy R's in your blending drill. You know you always put them in the medial position because it starts with a vowel. That's the rule. Now, here we go. They're able to blend this and we're going to say that's going to be verb but make sure if it's a bossy R that you do not put the E at the end okay because we can't jump over these two consonants and also it's just a different sound R controlled is a different sound so when you do the blending drill don't turn the magic E over when there's an R controlled right here does everybody understand why okay okay we're gonna get warmed up this is the day of uh, partner practice it's gonna be <laughs> you will be part partner practice all day long and what you're going to do is you are going to um, make sure that you take out your blending deck 
and you're going to have this card available so that you can flex using the magic E. This card is a um, is 45 in the um, in the regular deck, in the blending deck. It's 45. So you're going to take that out and make sure you see that there, because you're going to use that to flex between seven different kind of. So to make this easy, you are going to use these particular cards. I didn't put any blends in here. Blends. I'm not, but we're not putting blends in here. I. No, we're not going to blend. Put blends in here. It just kind of muddies the waters. I would like you to concentrate on flexing between open and closed and magic e syllables. So no blends. Okay, and we're going to have you. Go ahead, pull your deck together, and then you're going to do uh, a blending drill, I mean a visual drill, then, then a blending drill with your partner, and then switch. Okay? Any questions? Okay. It's mini Thursday. Let's just remember. Hey, everybody. Um, good morning. Hope you're doing well. Um, what you're going to be doing is grabbing cards 1 to 59 of your basic blending deck, like Jamie just said, and you're going to go through the visual drill sorting into three piles. Now, I wanted to point out one thing. On the back of the cards, you can see you don't have to memorize what position they're supposed to be in. Um, I put that information on the back for you so that you can just, when you're going through the visual drill, let me show you how I do it. I think I showed this already this week. I kind of tip it forward a little bit so that I can see the back as my little cheat sheet and then I put it in that pile after we go through the blending drill. Some of the cards, um, I'm not going to be able to find one right away, <laughs> um, the cards like the welded sounds and there's a few more that show you on the back, um, there's one, um, that show you on the back there's a little like a no symbol and that tells you when you get to that card you're going to cover up that last position with your hand. Um, so I just wanted to show you that those are on the back so you don't have to memorize everything. And you're going to go through the visual drill, sort, tapping the cards and sorting it into your three piles. You're going to move them onto your blending board. And you're going to practice um, the blending drill with open, so covering up that last sound, open, and then opening up so that it's a closed syllable, like hi to H-I-M is a closed syllable. And then you're going to stick that magic E on the end, which is card 45, um, to try to practice it with a magic E syllable. So remember to make sure you're putting your uh, bossy R cards in the middle position and, um, and don't put the magic E on the end when it has a bossy R. Sound good? A couple of questions and clarifications. I'm going to show you a couple of things. Some one, one person said, make sure you don't do P-H-U-X. Okay. Okay. Be aware of that one. Um, we have this particular word, and the kid says bass. And if you turn the E over, you can say, why can this not work? Well, it can't jump over two letters. But we have this, and somebody said, could I do this? And I said, this is the, there's two words in which this happens, in clothe and in bathe, where it's changed this from a short vowel to a long vowel. Um, so don't muddy your waters with that, because it's only two words. We spent way too much time this morning going over words that this may happen. But what we found is 
basically the E does a lot of different things and it oftentimes just changes the TH to a, from an unvoiced to a voice. Like in su uh, teeth and teeth, um, okay, well, I can't remember some of the other words we went to. We soothe, soothe sooth and soothe. We use this book, um, the complete, um, we'll send that out. It's a really fun book where you just go over stuff and it gives you the amount of times that you're going to come across that particular spelling because I am one of those people that if it happens only three times, I'm not going to teach it to the kids. So, sure. It, um, can you do that? Um, okay. She'll send it out. She's good. Okay. She turned me on to that book and I ordered it and got it the next day and now I feel, now we've just been having discussions about sounds. It's kind of nerdy. So anyway. What I want to talk about next is vowel team syllables. And um, vowel teams um, are when, and I'm going to give you the little jingle, and you're going to have to write it down because we realized we didn't have it in the, in the book. This is the little jingle that goes with the vowel team syllable. It is when you have a team of letters working together, to make one vowel sound. Let's do it together. When you have a team of letters working together to make one vowel sound. We'll send that out too, right? Anyway, that is the important thing. It's not a team of vowels, it's a team of letters. Um, when some letters are with a vowel, that makes a vowel team. It could be um, two, it could be three, or it could be four letters that are together to make a vowel sound. It is important to remember, remember, I, I mean, I used to do this. When two vowels go walking, the first one does a talk right. about. Um, I taught, used to teach that, and Except. it's probably ruined about, it, it's only true 40% of the time. So don't teach that because that, what I find, what I found when I did that, when I taught that and then we would go into oh, oh, every time you say oh, oh, they always say oh. So you don't want to get them into that routine of just looking at the first letter and saying its name. Okay? This is um, the vowel team syllable card. And it says, a syllable with a team of letters working together to make one vowel sound. And um, they become very adept at figuring this out and knowing this. And I'm going to go through all the vowel sounds because I want to make sure that you know them all. Now, if you are teaching a kid EU, you've gotten all the way and you've gone to EU, you got to say to yourself, does this kid need to be in reading support anymore? You know. Um, but some of these are very common with, um, at, the, at the very lowest level. So the vowel team syllables are um, 75, and then there's a, and then we're going to go 78 through 101. Let me write that down for you. Oh, here it is. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. It's going to be 75, which is, I believe, A-I. Yeah. And then it's going to be 78 through 101. I'm going to give you a moment to pick those out because I want you to um, look at the cards. I think it's
Okay, it looks like most people have them. I have a request from Zoomland to go ahead and show you the jingle again. It's a team of letters working together to make one vowel sound. All right, let's do it together. It is a team of letters working, working together, together to make, to make one, one vowel, vowel sound. sound. All right. If you look at these cards, there is a jingle if you're into jingles, and you want to make sure that everything above the line is what you're going to be teaching, just those sounds above the line. Now, there are some more obscure uh, sounds for some of these. I don't teach, like, OU as an example. Uh, there's other sounds for OU. This is only the one I teach, and these are kind of extra ones. All right, we're going to go through the sounds, and then I'm going to have you uh, go through the sounds yourself, because some of them are tricky. Um, kind of keeping, okay, well, I'll go get to that later. This is AI. AI says A. It's very consistent. You also meet, need to make the children aware that AI cannot be at the end of a word. It's at the beginning or the middle. Okay? AU is, is a tricky sound because it sound, it's very close to a short O sound. But I teach my kids, it's deeper in your throat, and you say, aw. What is it? Aw. A-U says aw, as in August. Everybody say August. August. It's very important to have the key word for this particular one because it's a difficult um, sound for them to sound out. And I would say it's aw, as in August, when we do a um, auditory drill. A-U-G-H is one of those that has a um, four sounds and one, and f I mean four letters and one sound. It's aw, just like the A-U, aw. Everybody say it? Aw. aw. Yo, yeah, here's another one. A-W <laughs> is the same sound. It's aw as in paw. What is it? Aw. It's, if you hear aw at the end of a word, this is how you'll spell it. And there, it could be in the middle, but if you're listening, you see an aw, that's going to be spelled with an A-W. Can I ask a question? And this may, I may have just lost this knowledge. Uh -huh. um, at the top of the A-W card, right. it's crossed out. So, but this can come out the end of a sound, correct? It, it can. It just, and you can add a sound after, correct? Well, the reason why it has that is it, that muddies the waters. There's only certain letters that can go after it, and it's very uncommon. I mean, hawk, you could have a K after it, you could have an L after it, you can have an N after it. But if you, then you're going to have to find those letters to put after it. So that's why that's there. We don't want to muddy the waters too much, okay? Okay, the question is, uh, if, as you can see at the top of this card, there is a little eh, eh, um, that means don't put anything after that or you're going to cover up what comes after it because there's not very many letters that come after that. So we're going to teach it as an ending sound. So you might have a P after. Well, that's not going to happen. What's going to happen is maybe a K or an L or an N. So you just don't want to muddy the waters and get yourself confused and get the kids confused. Just don't put anything in the ending position. Yes? I never teach sounds together. I, okay. uh, I, do, I would do AU and AW and say AU is going to be at the beginning or middle, and A, W will be at the end, kind of the place value thing. Um, and so 
as they are learning that, they know to put the AU, if it's at the beginning or middle. Um, this is a tough thing. I mean, third grade, I've ta I taught that and kind of got into some letters that ca would come after that. But um, it is, it does confuse some kids. But there is important idea of place value. You're never going to have AU at the end. Okay. Here's another place value issue. AY is going to be at the end of a word, and it's not going to be at the beginning or the middle. So that's why it has that little after it. Okay. That's one of the first vowel teams I teach because they know play and way and day. This is really interesting. It's E-A, and it mostly says E, but also it's one of the few ways, um, to, uh, different ways to spell a short vowel sound. Um, and there's a little bit, and we could get into a really deep connection that, that you have words like heal that you want to change to health when you put a suffix to it, and so you use E-A because you can make it E and E. Heal um, and heal and health is an example of that. So it's another way to spell a short vowel sound. Um, EE is also a very early vowel team that you would teach kids. It's very consistent. It's more common than um, a magic E with an E. This is more common. I say E likes to be together. So if they're confused a little bit, about which one to use, I always say pick EE. -E. It's more common than E, consonant E. The kids really love this one. Doesn't happen a ton. E I G H. Four letters, one sound. It says A, as in eight. It's going to have a um, it's often followed by a T, except for in slay. Oh, anyway, um, E I says E as in ceiling or A as in reindeer. E and A. I'm going to tell you this is one of my. You know, I'm going to tell you before I le learned Orton, I was the worst speller, and one of my things is is it I E or E I. So, now this is one that I've never taught. If they can do this one, they should not be in with me. Um, <laughs> EU, it, it says U and U. And if you realize, if you think about that, those are the long U sounds. And so it's going to say either the long U, U, or the long U, U. It's hard to say. So. EW, again, that's one that you teach the kids. They know, they see the word new and, and maybe that's few and new. And again, it's the long U sounds, U and U, as in few and grew. Notice right up here, if we're putting it in the blending deck, we don't put anything after it. It's going to be at the end of words. EY, my, my, my experience with kids is um, when we talk about that E sound at the end of words like in happy and funny and silly, they want to put EY a lot of times. Y is so, so much more common. But EY says E as in turkey, and it says A as in obey, and they. Again, you're not putting anything after it. IE is something that kids know because a lot of names have IE in it. Um, and it says E as in peace and I as in pie. Piece of pie. We've talked about that a lot this week, piece of pie. IGH, you get a lot of bang for your buck when you teach kids early on because there's a lot of words that have IGH saying I. It can be at the end, but it also can be followed by a T. 
and sight, night, fight, flight, fright. Um, this is one I teach early on, like I said, because there's a lot of easy words that have IGH. OA, another one that I teach early on, OA is not going to be at the end of a word and it says O. Now OE will be at the end and will say O as in toe. So that's why you're not going to put anything after it. Okay, I love this one. Um, these vowel sounds are um, considered to be diphthongs, which is really cool because there's a P-H-T-H -H in the middle. And um, I tell the kids it's a slider because your mouth is sliding. And it's going to say, you're going to say, oi. You start out little and get big. Oi. Okay? It's a slider as in join. It will not be at the end of words. That's the place value piece that you talk about. It will not be at the end of words. Diphthongs are when your mouth slides. So it's going to be, it's going to be um, ow, ooh, ow, ooh, oi. Okay? This is probably not something you teach the kids. I just call them sliders. I think sometimes we give them too much information and just, again, my favorite word, muddies the waters for them. Um, this is OO. It has two sounds. The easy sound is oo, as in boo. And the, the little harder sound that you teach down the line is uh, as in book. Oo and uh, school book. OU is a diphthong because your mouth is sliding. It has several different sounds, but the one that we teach the kids early on is OU says, ow. See how my mouth slides? It starts out big, ow, and goes small. Um, I <laughs> taught this kid OU, and um, I talked about it being like in the word ow or ouch. And so when we were doing Zoom tutoring, I'm constantly going up to the, the little camera and pretending like I'm pinching them. And all I would have to do that, and they, they would have that extra little ow. Or if they're in, in person, I'd just pinch them. So. <laughs> um, O-U-G-H is one of those four letters. And it comes before that, uh, the T, and it says aw, oh, aw, oh, again. OW has two sounds. It's a slider as in plow, and it says O, and you would teach O first. OW saying O as in snow, and then they can remember by saying snow plow. Those are the two sounds for OW. Oh, here's the other, there's another diphthong, OY. It says OY. I start out little and get big. It is how you would spell oi at the end of words. Here's the uh, ue. It is a, again, it is the long u sound. It says u and u, as in argue and true. It's long u. And this is ui. It just says Ooh, as in fruit. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? There are some questions from Zoom land. Oh, okay, yeah. I have a question. Okay. Thinking about O U G H, mm -hmm. like in the word cough, how would we address, or though, how do we address that? It is, um, you're not going to get into that at the beginning. Um, you just would say, you yes, you say this is what it says most of the time. I'm going to be honest with you. I've never taught that. Okay. okay. They just figure it out when mm, get yeah. to it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I know cough is a red word. Right. Okay. I mean, it, you're it, always 
There are always those little, right. I just didn't know if there was a. Yeah. But it says O oh and DO. That's one of the sounds it makes, O. Oh. Yeah, and DO, mm -hmm. DO. So it does say O. Oh. Sometimes. Yeah. Yes. A co um, another question. She, oh, she wanted to know how you would address if it's O U G H, um, you know, because there's several different. You have a set thing that you do, and the rest of them are exceptions. Okay. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to ask. I've had kids ask me why does it the words say great for E A. So okay. There are three letters that? in which E A says A. Okay. Great steak and break. Okay. Those are exceptions. And I usually um, teach that in a spelling list. Those are the brain words for that spelling, or heart words for that spelling list. And I like to group things together so that they understand, um, you know, steak, break. What was the other one? Great. Great. Take a break with a great Yeah, great. Take a break with a great steak. Okay. Yeah, that'd be okay. <laughs> um, a couple of years ago, our second grader, second grade thought it'd be a really great idea if they taught all the spellings of a certain sound in the same week. Please do not do that. Okay? I would teach, especially, I mean, that's a whole class. I would tell you what I would do. And I'll, in third grade, we talked about AU and AW the same week and talked about uh, where you would find that in a word, we would do AI and AY together, and where would you find that 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 whole idea of where you're gonna, f how you're gonna spell it, depending on where it is in the word. That's the only thing I would do. And so then, when they are spelling, they can make an inf I'm sorry, informed decision. Oh, that's at the beginning. I'll put AI. I would because. There are kids that are going to say, oh, here are all the spellings for A, E-I-G-E-H, A-Y-A-I. And you can go on. There's going to be kids that are going to remember that. But I'm going to tell you right now, the majority will not. All right? OK, is there any other questions? This is, OK, I have another question. Um, in terms of like scope and sequence that we follow for our district curriculum, majority okay. of those always do you know, all the sounds together that sound the same, or even two sounds that, you know, like I've had four of the different foul teams in one week that I'm supposed to teach. How would you address that if we're supposed to do that for our district? Would you do one a day? How would you, like, finagle that in? Yeah, she said that in her particular district, they are required to teach all the different spellings in one week. Um, and she said, would you have them one a day? I would space them out as much as I, can, I could. I, I think kids are not, a lot of kids are not going to pick that up. And there's, you know, I had some really super fantastic kids who are great memorizers that probably spell better than I do in third grade, and they could do it. But there are so many kids that that would just be overload. And you know what, over, you, you know, you know what overload feels like. You're just, you shut down. So it's meaningless to them. Um, and they cannot make those determinations. So which one do you use? They just guess. Yeah. Yeah, they do. Do you Sometimes think you could just focus on maybe, like if you have, because we have the same thing, mm -hmm. I feel like, and it's awful. Mm -hmm. Like when we do the, the um, er, oh my gosh, I just dread that week. Mm -hmm. And so I'm thinking, and you know, I hate to say the lesser of two evils, but do you just really focus on two so they know them really, really well, and then just hope they kind of get the other two? Or do you know what I'm saying? I mean, you know, I, know that. I, I would really, okay, this person in, in the audience said that they have to do the same thing where they have to teach everything in one week or whatever. Is I would space them out as, as much as possible um, and then try to get that whole idea changed. I mean, the person that, yeah. yeah. Nice. I know. That's and I, you know, I, and I. <laughs> Listen to the teacher. Yes. Um, I, I, I'm, I, I teach in a school where we have a lot of autonomy, and I basically teach what I want. <laughs> and that is really nice. But with that comes a lot of responsibility. You've got to be on your game and say, Ugh, I've left this out or whatever. Um, but um, there's been times where I've closed my door and secretly done stuff. Don't say I said that, okay. 
Um, uh -oh. um, so I would like you to go through these um, with a partner and try to get the different sounds for each of the, of the uh, vowel teams. Just practice them. Hey, everybody. <laughs> um, so can you give me, if you want me to go over all the sounds super quick, just type a little yes in the chat. Um, otherwise, I will just tell you about this one because somebody was asking me. Okay, I see a yes. Okay, real quick. Um, this one is the E-A-R card, right? And it can say ear or er, your ear heard. There are common exceptions. So I know somebody was asking, well, what about bear, pear, tear, where? heart, right? There's always exceptions. Not always. There's a lot of exceptions. I try my best to put those exceptions here on the bottom. Typically, I wouldn't teach those explicitly. Um, I would just wait if it, if it came up. Because the reason those are exceptions is because the other, the other spellings, the other sounds are more common, okay? All right, so just so you can see these one more time, remember if you lean it, tilt, tilt it forward a little bit, you can see the key word and the diacritical marking so that you know um, the correct pronunciation. Okay, ready? A, 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 A. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> right in a row. A. E. E. Eat breakfast. Okay. Ear. Er. E. E. A. A. There's, remember, there's three cards that have both sounds of the long U. E, U, E, W, and U, E. Those all have the th same two sounds. They're the, both sounds of the long U. U and U. E, W again. U and U. A few grew. E, Y is E and A. A turkey who won't obey. <laughs> okay. I. Piece of pie. So piece of pie. E, I. Uh, those were almost exactly the same um, commonality, so if you want to say E, I, or I, E, I don't think it matters. Um, I. O. O. Oi. U and U. Uh. I used to teach my students, ooh. Ugh. <laughs> because that was easy for them to remember, and there's actually no way, when you see a word with an OO, there's no way to tell which pronunciation it is. You just have to check the context. So I taught them, ooh, ugh, and then they could just try both and see if, they, if that made sense to them. Um, again, this is another one that has a lot of spell or a lot of uh, pronunciations. The best one is ow to remember. We know it's the best because it's above the line. Aw, <laughs> right? Thought. Oh, ow, snow plow. Oi, again, the two sounds of the long U, ooh, and U, and fruit, ooh. Okay. A lot of different things that were, a lot of questions we ask. When the vowel teams, once you introduce them, do go into the visual drill. At this point, you're going to be taking things out if they're pretty solid. Don't ever take the short vowels out. Does everybody understand? Most important sounds that you can be teaching them and practicing are the short vowels. Never take the short vowels out. Um, you, a question came up like this, okay? 
they were concerned because we but because it had that little eh, eh thing out that they put that at the end vowels 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 if it starts with a vowel it goes in the middle and in this situation let's say we turned up this vowel and it's a w we know automatically to cover that last letter up does everybody understand okay it's if a vowel team ends in a y or a w you cover that last sound up i hope that didn't mess everybody up okay any other questions yes Yeah, sorry. Um, yes, so I see somebody wrote, what about lawn? So yes, you're absolutely right. The A-W can come, at the, at, can come in the middle. It can, it can often be followed by an L, N, or a K. That's also on the back of your, um, your card. But easiest way, most foolproof way, is just to cover that last sound, right? So then if you want to remember L, N, or K at the end after the A-W, you can. But if you just want to simplify it for yourself, you can just keep it you know, in the middle and always cover. That's what I used to do. When you, when you first teach it, you're just teaching it AW at the end. And if it's in a blending deck, we're just going to say it's at the end. Because you're going to be looking for that K to put on at the end. But in a blending deck, it's going to be at the end when you're blending. OK, and then one more quick thing about the cards. So there's all the, um, not all of them, but most of them have a little mnemonic device, a little rhyme or something. Um, and those aren't meant to teach them immediately, right? A lot of them say, after you teach both sounds. Um, so it's just kind of a way they, when I was learning all the vowel teams, it helped me learn where they come in the sound. I'm, I, like, I like the auditory, right? I like rhymes, in the, if you can't tell. I like rhymes and songs. Those help me remember. So I tried to put those on there just as an additional scaffold. You don't ever have to use them if they don't flow for you, right? Um, and if they're confusing, like Jamie said, sometimes kids don't learn like that. So you have to know your students and what works for them. But those are there for you or for your students, just if it helps. That's all. OK? Are you good on that? All right. Okay, I skipped one syllable sort, so we're going to go to page 102 in the book with a picture of Marion, 102, and we have a syllable sort, okay? You are going to look at all of these syllables, these are the ones we have learned, and decide whether it's closed, open, magic-y, bossy R, or vowel team syllable. Um, I just want to show you the answers here for the closed. We had flank, blast, scram, strap, and phlegm. Now flank is that one from yesterday that we talked about. Um, so some of you might say, is that really closed? Um, for me, I probably wouldn't put it in closed, but remember Dr. Sparks who teaches this says it's closed. Okay, bow, blay, go, grow, and sigh all open because they all end in a vowel and the vowel is long, says it's long name. Magic E, tame, slide, a nonsense word aid, and rice all end in magic E, hopping over one letter to give the power to the vowel. Bossy R all has a R after the vowel, which controls what that vowel says. Turn, burst, purse, firm, and charm. And then your vowel teams. Um, seech, saw, broil, ploy, and stream. Any questions on that? Any questions from Zoom? Nope. Okay. 
Well, we are ready for your last syllable pattern. <laughs> Let's get excited. It's the last one. Woo-hoo! <laughs> so here we are. We've done our close. We've done our open. We've done vowel team, magic E, our controlled. And the last one that we're doing now is consonant L-E. So this is card S57, supplemental card S57. And the consonant L-E comes at the end of a word that has two or more syllables. And it's called consonant L-E because there's a consonant and it's always followed by an L-E. So, in your um, blend or supplemental card deck, you have a card that says S12, and it has on it all of the consonant L-E syllables. Notice every single one of them ends with an L-E, and all of them have a consonant before it, and CK and ST have two consonants before it. Okay, so this is, you, I'd want, like you to make yourself a note someplace. This is the card you would use after you've taught all of them. So you, uh, you don't have individual ones in your deck. So make yourself a note that you will need to make those individual cards for the consonant LE. Um, now, like I said, it comes at the end, so this is always going to go in your final pile. Um, and I'm making a point of that because you're making your own cards for this, so there won't be squares on the back, but it'll always go in the final pile. Okay, they call it the final stable syllable, and it doesn't really make a vowel sound. So let's do this one together. It's bull. Can everybody say that? Bull. Coal. 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 Say it with me, please. Dull. Dull. Bull. Bull. Goal. Goal. Coal. Pole, toll, zoll, and soul. I put a little X under the T because you don't hear the T. It's silent. Like in the word whistle, you hear the S-L-E. There aren't a lot of words that have S-T-L-E, whistle, thistle, castle. Um, when I look at my word book, where place I get words from, there just are like eight or ten words that have S-L-E. But the T is silent, like in Kessel. Okay. Now, how to teach these. <laughs> Some kids can handle half of them. I have a second grader going into third grade, and I wrote each of these on a card all the way down to goal, and I said, what do you notice about those? And he said, well, they all end in E, and they all have an L-E and then some other consonant before it. And I said, yes. So I was able to teach him all of those at one time. And then in the next lesson, I was able to teach him all of those. Not S-L-E, I saved that for its own little thing because of the silent letter. However, I have another student who's also going into third grade. No way. I couldn't even do two of them at once. She's one of my hardcore dyslexic kids. I have to do one at a time. Even though they seem so similar to us, all you're doing is changing that first sound. For her, it was, I tried to do two, and that was a train wreck. <laughs> so I was like, okay, we're going to back up and do one tomorrow, honey. My bad. Um, but anyway, it will always come at the end. So, like, here's some words with it in it. 
cable. So I have an open syllable and then my consonant LE syllable. What's this say again? Bowl. I'm just going to do the consonant LE part. Bowl. Here's another word where I have, did I say closed? I meant open. If I, did I say open? Okay, open and consonant LE. Then I have uncle. Say the CLE again. Cold. So I have a closed and a consonant LE. Now, this one's kind of strange because you notice I put a dot there because it, and typically you would not break apart CK, right? You're going to keep CK together. But again, as I said, in OG we teach patterns. And so we want them to remember that it's a consonant LE, so I'm going to break it right before there for them. So I have the word tickle. So what kind of a syllable pattern is this? Closed, Closed and consonant LE. What's this say? Cold. Cold. Okay. I have the word idle and open and a consonant LE. What's this say? Dull. Dull. I have the word raffle, closed syllable, consonant LE, full. full. Everybody? Full. full. I have a closed syllable gig. And a consonant LE, goal, everybody? Goal. goal. And then I have a closed syllable and a consonant LE. This is pull, simple. Everybody, this syllable? Pull. pull. And then what kind of a syllable is this? R controlled. R controlled because that R comes after the vowel. So this is bossy R, tur, tull. So I have bossy R and consonant LE. How do we say this one? Toll. Then I have closed and consonant LE. Sizz, how do I see this one? Sizzle. Sizzle. Okay, here's that tricky one. Castle. I marked off the T because it's silent, but it's um, old for this one. And so I've got closed, old. So it's castle. So can you say soul? Soul. And then I wanted to do a three-syllable word to show you that it can also be in more than two syllables. So I have the word closed crab, closed app, and then consonant LE, pull again. So crab apple. But it is going to be the final syllable in a multi-syllable word. Whether that be a two-syllable word, a three-syllable word, it could be in four-syllable words too. Um, Let's see. So let me show you if I was doing the blending drill with this. Oh, let me make a point too before I do that. My student who I can only do one with at a time, she also was like, Ugh, N's and an E, it must be a magic E. So for her, she was confusing the magic E with it too, but I had to remind her, remember honey, in magic E, you start with E, jump back over one, and it has to be a vowel there. That's not a vowel, that's a consonant. And a consonant can't say it's loud and strong name like vowels can. I probably have said that about 50 times. <laughs> it's still not in there. Um, it's, this is a hard one for her. And it will be for other students. Okay, so in your blending drill, when you make those cards, you will put that in the final pile because it doesn't start with a vowel. The only time it goes in the middle pile is if it starts with a vowel. There's does not start with a vowel, so it goes in the final pile. So how would we blend this word, whole word? Okay, you know what? My bad. I'm teaching you syllable division tomorrow. We'll wait till tomorrow on that. It would actually be shakel, but I will explain that tomorrow on why it's shakel, okay? Remember, this is its own syllable. We kind of have to cover that up, and then what do we have left? Shay. And... If this is its own syllable, che, dull, chadle. But I'll get into more, tomorrow more about the syllable division with that and how we count back three. Let's do one more. Um, 
Again, this is its own syllable, so this would be pronounced weekle. weekle. Okay? And I'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow uh, when we do syllable division. When you see how all of these patterns just keep repeating themselves over and over again in words, and it gets really cool. And if you're like me, you'll be driving down the street, and you'll be reading signs and go, oh, that sign has a open and a closed <laughs> and a blah, blah, blah syllable in it. That's when you know that you better buy yourself this book because you've been bitten by the bug. <laughs> The OG bug that just makes you go, wow, you look at words in a whole new way. Okay, um, so if you want to take a moment to get out card S12, that doesn't come up very well, just so that you can put that in your fair deck. And then you probably want to make a little note on that that says, on an S12, make individual cards. You'll be going to teach that and you'll think, did I lose those cards? <laughs> nope, you didn't lose them. They're not in there. <laughs> Okay, so in the OG Educator's Manual, which is this book, it's on page 28, and the key takeaway there is that the consonant LE syllables occur at the end of multisyllable words and they contain a consonant and an L-E, okay? So that is your key takeaway. And then we haven't been showing you these, but in the back of this book, starting on page 183, they have some nice visuals on the different syllable patterns. Um, they have one for each kind. Val team, magic E, and the consonant LE. So I just wanted to, to point those out. They are in black and white, which isn't the most colorful, but, you know, you can make them colorful. But I just wanted to point those out. As you teach them, you can put those up in your room. Okay. Um, I'm going to say page 91 in this booklet until tomorrow when I teach you this, how to divide those syllables. And what we're going to do now, since you've learned all six of these, we are going to do a syllable sort. So, with all six of them, and this is, happens to be an electronic one. Excuse me? A partner. Thank you for keeping me on track. No, we're not skipping the partner practice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay, if you would take out your consonant LE syllable card and this, and let's take, I think we have five minutes, ten minutes. Ten minutes to teach each other the consonant LE syllable pattern, okay? How it always has, ends in an E, has a consonant and an L and an E. And then it's going to be at the end of your syllable. So if you could just teach it, your word, excuse me, if you could just teach it to each other, that would be great.
Okay, hey everybody, super quick. So there's two cards in the supplemental deck. If you have it, there's this one is S12, um, and then Jamie stole my other card. <laughs> so the other card is the Clover type, which is S57. Um, and the only thing, that, the main thing to point out to your students is that a consonant LE um, syllable has a consonant followed by an LE right? Um, you'd think it would be self-explanatory, but it isn't. <laughs> so there's this card if you want to go over the individual sounds. Might be fun to go over those individual sounds with your partner now just to make sure you're both on the same page with pronunciation. Um, and then send a chat right now if you have a question. I'm just going to glance over here. I did want to say, I think um, Christy's copy of the educator guide for some reason has hers in black and white, but some of them have them in color. So I don't know what the difference is, but some of them have them in color. Okay. Um, were there any questions out in the audience here about consonant L-E? Nope. How about up on Zoom? Nope. Okay. All right. So now what we're going to do is a syllable sort with all six of these patterns. And we did not tell you people in our audience here to bring your computer, so you'll need to do this on your phone. Um, does everybody have a touch screen phone? Does anybody still have a flip phone? <laughs> I know some people still do have those flip phones. You're saving a lot of money and using your time a lot more wisely without that phone constantly at you. Um, you can come up and do it with me. How about that? <laughs> oh, you've got a computer? Okay. TJ has a computer for you. Okay. So what everyone will need to do, both in Zoom, on Zoom and here, is you'll need to find your email from this morning that TJ sent you. So I'll give you a minute to do that, and then you'll click on this syllable pattern sorting game. And then once there, these are all different syllable patterns. Some are um, real words and some are nonsense words. And you'll just take them and drag them into the right category. Now for the consonant LE, you will notice that the consonant LE is highlighted. So that one would go there. Okay? So you just click and drag. And then there's a place to submit your answers at the end. Um, I don't think it'll probably take much more than three, three to four minutes. Is it taking yours a long time to load? Gargle? Oh, I missed gargle, too. <laughs> because the GLE is highlighted, so that needs to be in constant LE. It does have a first syllable. That's bossy R. 
Thank you. You didn't miss Gargle, I miss Gargle. <laughs> no, I put it with the other. <laughs> oh, you did too? Yeah. Um, and, and it's actually made of two, a, a bossy R and a consonant LE, but it was the consonant LE since that's bold and highlighted. Um, so we both missed it for the same reason. <laughs> I guess we're not going to have kids do this, but typically, I mean, technically, it could have gone in either area had that GLE. Yes, you would just have to themselves. really tell them it's on the consonant LEs, they're highlighted, right. or a little bolder, rather. Um, but I probably wouldn't count that wrong. The machine would, though, because it's set up to do it that right. way. Okay, so this is one thing. I, I belong, I subscribe to this, and it's like, it's under $10 a month. Um, but there might be more that you could, like some of these have, if several of you come together in a school and get it, then it's cheaper. But what I like, one of the things I like about this, I can go to my results and it will tell me by question what they got right then it'll give me, these are people from last week, it'll give me the, the student scores, how many they got right, how long it took them. So there's a lot of information on here that I can get as a teacher. Now, somebody else asked, um, Julie asked, she said, it's called Word Wall, by the way. Um, and because I belong, I can create as many games as I want because I pay monthly. Um, but most of what I put on there, I make it public. So that means anybody can access them for free, the ones that are public. You could just go on there and like search close syllable, six syllable sort, and you can find mine and probably plenty of other people's who have done it for free, and you don't have to pay for that. Um, because I make mine so, I don't know, precise, I guess, for the various students that I teach, it just made it easier for me to get my own subscription so that I can make my games exactly how I want them. I think it lets you make three or four games for free, and then you have to pay to make your own. But like I said, there's all sorts of people, I mean, everyone that I make, unless I just feel like it wouldn't pertain to anybody out there. I make it public so that anybody can, can use it. And a lot of people do that. Um, you can just put in whatever and things come up um, that you can use. Okay, any other questions? All right. So, um, Kate, that might come in handy for you, too, for you and I talked about you were wanting some apps for kids to do independently. Okay. Let's see. We are finished with syllable patterns. You guys did a super job. Yay! You made it. <laughs> you made it through all six of them. Okay. What we're going to skip to now is um, sentence dictation procedures. So we kind of did this yesterday in the, in the lesson plan um, when we did the overall lesson, but I want to go through it a little bit more slowly and methodically today. If you take out your Marion um, supplemental document book and turn to page 93, So again, in terms of your lesson plan, we're down here to the dictation part, which is the sentence part. So that's where we would be in the lesson plan. Okay, so the teacher reads the sentence with expression that they're expecting the student to write on their student response sheet. And then the student repeats it back. Remember yesterday I had you repeat the sentence back. And then the student puts the um, sentence on their fingers this time one finger per word. And then if there's more than five words in the sentence, you just tap again. So for example, in there we 
we go. The dog will jump on the bed. So in this one, it would be the dog will jump on. I'm going back to my pinky, the bed. So you stick with your same hand and just go back. But if it's only a three or less than five, then you I've, that's an easy one. I will stop. Okay, but more than five, you just keep going. You start over again on the same finger. And then they um, write the sentence, then they edit it, um, checking for their capitalization, spelling, and proper end, and then they correct their sentence as needed. Okay, so let us do the dog will jump on the bed. Repeat it, please. Now, let's put it on your um, hands, one finger at a time. The dog will jump on the bed. Now you would write it. Okay? I have a question about the figure notation. Mm -hmm. Would it be, I know we use our non-dominant hand, but when it has more than the five words, would it be okay for them to go on to a second hand? It's more efficient if you just stay on this one because you have your dominant hand with the pencil in it ready to write the sentence. So if you don't have to put it down, pick it back up, it's just more efficient to repeat. Is it wrong? No, but you can get the same effect this way and not have to put down the pencil or pen. Um, okay, now, yesterday I pointed out you know, this is a nice thing to put up in the classroom, your um, sentence strip. This helps them remember there's a capital there and that there's a, some sort of punctuation mark here, and here's the rest of their sentence. Um, and the reason you want them to repeat it, put it on the finger before they write, is it helps store it in their memory, in their short-term memory. If you just give it to them, they'll write one word and say, what was that sentence? <laughs> Um, and then you'll need to go through it again. Now, I will tell you, in working with some of my children, when it's a longer sentence, like a dog will jump on the bed, if they don't get it, I give them half the sentence at a time. So you can do that if they're just, you don't want to frustrate the heck out of them. So I, I do that for those who need it. So I'll say, a do the dog will jump. The dog will jump. Okay, write that. And then, on the bed. On the bed. Okay. Okay, um, cops. You all know about cops? Some, say, some say, are saying yes, and some have the question mark. So it's the most wonderful thing about having people in the room. <laughs> Last week, a couple of days, we didn't have people in the room because the toilets broke, and or didn't break. We had to turn the water off. And um, we're just looking for those faces, you know, to say, yeah, I get it, or no, I don't. It's so different for a teacher to just, teach to a camera. Okay, so COPS is an acronym for, did I remember my capitals? Did I remember my capital letter? Is my word order correct? Did I put punctuation at the end? And what is my S for? Jamie, what's my S for? It flew out of my mind. Cops. Huh? Spelling. Okay. So that's what COPS stands for. Some people use cups. They put a U there instead of an O, and it's for understanding. Does the sentence make sense? It's just a, a mnemonic to help you, help the students remember their editing steps. Okay, any questions besides the one I have on Zoom for sentence dictation? Okay, my question on Zoom was that sentence dictation is a real struggle for ELL students. Is it okay to show students the entire sentence first? Um, I'm assuming that means to show it to them in written form. 
probably would not do that. I would probably just break the sentence down into smaller chunks. Even if that means, if you have to do it one word at a time, I, I'd start trying for two words and see if you can do two and then add on as they become successful with that. Um, so my person on Zoom, did that help? Did that answer your question? If you could shoot a yay or nay. It's okay. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Any other Zoom questions? Okay. So on our schedule, we, as Jamie promised you in the morning, you're going to be doing lots of partner practice today. <laughs> um, but please, I know you might think, oh, another one. But please, if you take the time to do it, it's just, it helps it stick. It's that that glue, that kinesthetic piece that helps it stick. Um, so what we're going to do now is partner practice, and one teacher will do the cat sat on the red mat, and the other, the box fell off the cart. Okay? Hey, okay, so we're just doing a quick sentence dictation between you and your partner. The sentences are on your schedule. The only thing I wanted to point out is just make sure that when you're doing this on your own, make sure that every word in that sentence is fair. And I'll have Christy talk a little bit more about what that means with sight words and stuff when we come on back. Hey, Jen, one of our participants in the room, had a great idea with cops for the editing steps. She said, um, it's grammar police. Be your own police person and um, edit your work with cops. So I, I really liked that and wanted to share that with you. I'm going to use that from now on. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Jamie. Okay. We're taking it into to lunch. We're going to go over a, a few little things. Um, and then break for lunch. Um, we had some questions about s word walls or sound walls. Um, I uh, went online and found a website, um, Mrs. Winter's Bliss, that had some really cool word walls. Um, okay, if you look up, uh, up here, Mrs. Winter, obviously this is basically uh, Linda Mood Bell. Um, lips program and she's obviously had it and what she has on there is the phoneme group labels which we don't need to get into nasals and fricatives you don't have to put that but I what I love about this is the picture of the kids mouth and what they're doing um, and then um, the different spellings as they learn a spelling they put it underneath the sound not um, with the beginning letters I'll move on um, so this is what a word wall looks like. Um, the different spellings for each of those particular um, sounds, as you can see with the, that means k and the c and the k and the ck, excellent. Um, I, I, I'm going to show you this because that zh really doesn't happen, but that is the least um, common sound in the English language, which was zh, you can say that. And there's different ways to spell that. That's kind of higher level. I don't really, I haven't really gotten that into that because I haven't done above fourth grade. Um, so those are the consonant sounds. And then um, here is what I loved. Um, this is the vowel valley or a vowel circle. It has all of the vowel sounds. These are all the vowel sounds. I, I don't think you can probably see the the um, uh, called cra uh, crazy R's, uh, bossy R's, it's, it's blocked. But this shows you all the vowel sounds and what your mouth is doing. So it's E, 
I, A, E, E, I, A. Your mouth is closing, then it does A, 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 U, U. Your mouth closes. Um, and then down at the bottom, they have the, we, we call them the sliders, diphthongs, oi and ow. And over to the right is the, um, like I said, the crazy hours, but I'm sure you can't see it at home because it's blocked. But that's just an example. And then as you learn a different way to spell that, you put it underneath that particular sound. Um, I kind of, I think that's kind of cool. Um, anyway, I'm going to. Uh, go away from that and t uh, talk to you about, if I can find, oh, here we go. Is this the thing? Okay. This is a touch screen we just found out and we really like it. <laughs> it's like your phone. Okay. We're gonna, I'm just going to talk to you about a couple of little rules that m you might not know. Kind of go over them in case questions come up. To, when you have a plural, there's only two ways to show, well, let me, I'm not going to say that because moose, but um, to make a word a plural, you put an S or an ES. But if it ends with a S sound or a Z sound, which are really kind of, um, kind of go together, you need to put an e after, a to, e after to let people know that it's not a plural. Okay, so the S-E can say either S as in mouse or Z as in cheese. So that's what you need to tell the kids. It's not a plural because it has an E after it, but it can say either S or Z. So, so that they're aware that a lot of times S says Z. We're going to put that on when we, when we when touch the S on the... Um, in the, the deck, we're going to have them say s, z, okay? The Y. Y does not, has its own consonant sound, and it's only a consonant sound when it's at the beginning of a word. The other times we say it, it's a borrower. It borrows, borrows, it's, um, I can't talk anymore. And the most common the ones that you need to teach to kids are that it says I at the end of a little word in my shy try, fly, fry, because that's what they're going to encounter early on. And it says E at the end of a multisyllable word. Those are the two. Those are so common. Now, in some Latin and Greek words that are at higher levels, you're going to have Y in the middle, and it's going to borrow um, the I sound as well as in t um, gym, gymnastics, which is a Greek word. And those are the higher level. But we are going to only have three sounds on this card. It's going to say Y, and then I at the end of a one-syllable word, E at the end of a multi-syllable word. I actually say two syllables in my class, but there are some words that have more than three syllable, two syllables that say E. So that's what you want them to know. Most common way to spell E at the end of a word, a two-syllable word is E. I mean Y. Okay? So that's what you do with the Y card. And you're going to tap it three times, and I'm going to tell you again, it's going to be Y, I at the end of a one-syllable word, E at the end of a multi-syllable word. Okay, it's going to say ya, yeah, and then I at the end of a one-syllable word, E at the end of a multi-syllable word. If you forget, it's on the back. Okay. And like I said, you don't need to get into what says I in some words that have a Greek or Latin origin because that's not something that's going to come, you're going to come across with a remedial student or a young student that you're teaching. Um, we had some questions about the U 
and the oo, how you can say both you and oo. So I want to go over that again. Um, if we look at the back of the card, it can say the you sound like in refuse, and it can say the oo sound like in rule. Okay, these vowel teams that Jamie introduced to you today, anytime a letter combination or a single letter says you, it also says oo. And the reason what, what is dependent upon is the letter that is in front of it. Because remember, we talked about yesterday, your letter, your mouth just, it can't actually make the U sound without being, not saying the word correctly. So here we have the U sound like in feud and the U sound like in sleuth, where my mouth is round. Here in the vowel team EW, it makes the two sounds few, where my chin goes down, but it also says oo, like in gru. And this vowel team, the same thing, it says you, like in argue, and it says oo, like in true. So I just tell my students when they're introduced to the second sound, the oo sound, I just tell them anytime a letter says you, it has to say ooh too because of the way it comes out of our mouths. Okay, so if you would turn to page 103 in this notebook, let's take a couple minutes. And if you would get, everybody except for my friend with the flip phone, <laughs> If you would get out your phone and take your camera so th that it's looking at your mouth um, so that you can see yourself in it like you're taking a selfie, but you don't actually have to take a selfie. I want you to use it as a mirror so that you can see for yourself with these. So like if we're up here with the magic E and we say the word cube, everybody say cube and watch what your mouth is doing. Cube. Do you see how that chin is going down? Cube. Now say, um, down here, let's try the magic E syllable, dune, and watch what your mouth is doing. Dune. Do you see how it's more puckered on that one? Dune. All right, let's say cute. Is it saying you or ooh and cute? You, cute, and your chin is dropping down. But if we say the word dude, what's your mouth doing on dude? Say that, dude. See how your lips are kind of puckered? The difference between the you and the oo? Well, here's our vowel team, Q. Say it and tell me whether it's saying long U or oo. Q, it's saying the long U. Now let's go down here to that... Um, same vowel team syllable, D-U-E, and say that one, do. Do you see how your mouth is kind of round in do? Yay? No? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, I was actually just going through my letters. I don't know if you saw me up here, if anybody was looking, but I was like saying each one to figure out, okay, which consonants make it say the oo sound. And when a D, you don't have to write these down, but when a, these consonants come in front of either a U or an EW or an EU, those are the ones that are going to make your mouth do the oo sound instead of the U sound. It's really something more for you to just be aware of. Um, but when you teach that second sound to kids, I think it's helpful for them to look at their mouth and see what their mouth is doing. Um, whenever I teach it, I literally put my hand up here to be sure that the words I'm choosing <laughs> make either the U sound or the oo sound, because this one is a hard one for me to differentiate. Okay, any questions on those? Any questions from Zoom participants? Okay. 
All right, now back to schedule. So if you would turn, well, let's do red word, um, to supplemental documents, page 94. Same book that we were just in. Just back a few pages. Okay, just to show you where we are in our lesson plan. Yesterday, um, I did not actually introduce a new red word to you, if you recall, because I said I would do that today. So just, you see it's on the student response sheet at the very end. And the reason for that is because it doesn't play fair. So we don't want to mix it in with all the fair part of the lesson plan. We want it to be its own separate chunk. Um, some teachers have said, well, the problem with that is sometimes I don't get to the end. So if you find that, move it to the beginning. If you find that you're always ditching the red word, just because you don't have time. So move it to the beginning sometimes, but you don't want to interweave it in the lesson plan. You want it to be its either beginning or end, okay? All right, so if we look on page 94, when I'm introducing a new red word, um, I'm going to show the word to the students. So here's my word, were. Notice I wrote it in red. I write it in red. You can choose your own color, and if you don't want to call them red words, but write it in a different color so that they know that it's a word that doesn't play fair. It does not follow the rules. Um, and if you've already taught the concept of why the word doesn't play fair, then tell them. For example, this word, if I were teaching this word, I would say to the students, what should this word say if I've already taught open syllable? If I haven't, I'm not going to go into it. And what should it say? It should say do. But it doesn't. It says do, so I'm going to teach you that it says do. And it's a red word that we have to memorize. If you haven't taught the skill, so go to number two where it says, the very last sentence where it says, if you haven't taught this concept of why the word wouldn't play fair, then just tell the student. I suggest crossing that sentence out. This will be an edit that I will make. Because if you haven't taught them the skill and you tell them why it doesn't play fair, it's going to sound like wah, 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 wah. <laughs> They don't have anything to hang it on to. So if it doesn't play fair, just say it doesn't play fair. And, but if, if you've taught them the skill, tell them why. Okay, then you ask them to write the red word either by skywriting it, which is probably one of the simpler things to do in a classroom, or on a rough surface. Teacher last week said she was going to get um, sandpaper things for her children. She was going to have an OG bag that had everything in it for them, and she was going to get some sandpaper. That was going to be her rough surface because it was simple, it was easy. Um, I often use a brick in my classroom and I have them put a piece of paper over it and write, push really hard with a crayon and that makes a nice multi-sensory piece. Um, but I, I work with small groups or individuals. I don't have a classroom. So it's much more, you know, you want something easy to manage. It's in a bag, get your OG stuff out. So I thought her idea was really nice. I've also used um, sand. Nah. Sometimes the people who clean up at the end of the day don't really like the sand. It gets a little all over the place, but it is nice. And now, of course, in COVID day, everybody would have to have their own sand tray. We don't want to be sharing that sand. So anyway, you either want them to write the word after you show it to them three times, either skywrite or on some sort of a rough surface. And then they're going to copy the word one letter at a time because that allows their brain to take a picture of it each time they look up at it. So in a word like were, if they're t doing it one letter at a time, they're looking at that word four times. Their brain has taken a picture of that word. So they write the W, then they look down, write that, then they look back up, write the E, okay? And then they write it two more times. And they always say the letters as they write them. 
And then I often will ask the students, close your eyes and see if you can write it with your eyes closed, um, skywrite it with your eyes closed. And then lastly, they check to see if it's in their memory. So let me show you how that works on the lesson plan. So, okay. We're going to, I'm going to, I just kind of gave you the overview. Now I'm going to go through it with you. Okay, so my new red word today is were. Oh, shoot. I wish I had both of these things at once. Okay, I haven't taught why this wouldn't play fair, so I'm going to leave that all out. Okay, everybody, what is this red word? word? Okay, now I want you, I'm not telling you why it doesn't play fair, now I want you to skywrite it. Remember, we take our lid off our marker, as Lacey says, we put it right up here, get these two fingers out on our dominant hand, and add, you're going to say the letters as you write them. W, E, R, E, were. Again, W, E, R, E, were. One more time. W, E, R, E, were. Okay, so you've done that three times. Now, just find a piece of paper on your desk, and I want you course on the students they would be doing it right here this is where they're going to be writing it on their sheet three times okay so what I want you to do is look up here catch the letter W write the letter W and say it go ahead and do that everybody W now look up here again get your next letter E look up again R E. You're still on the computer. No, I'm still on this. I'm sorry. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. It's kind of hard to take a picture of something you can't see, isn't it? <laughs> okay. Now I want you to write it three more times, saying each letter as you write it. So you're going to say W. Let me hear you. R E. Word. Okay, nice job. Um, now, this is where on the student response sheet, I'd ask them to check their brain, and I would say, cover up your new red word and see if you can write it from memory. So go ahead and try that, everybody. See if you can write it from memory. Say it as you write it. W-E-R-E. -E. Now, if they got it right, you woohoo! And if they missed it, well, let's look at it one more time and, and write it again and fix that. And many times they will miss it when they go to write it. That's okay. They've only had a few times of working with it. So you can show it again. It's not like a, a final test or anything. Okay. Um, and I do think it's a nice idea. I want you to try to skywrite it with your eyes closed too, okay? Okay. Let's try that. W E R E were. Now open your eyes and skywrite it and tell me which one gives you more of a picture in your brain. How many people gave it gave more of a picture when they closed their eyes? Did that for me too. It made me really focus on what I was writing on the board my imaginary board. So if you want to change the sky writing to eyes closed after they have written it a couple times, do that. But they've got to see it a few times before they can try it with their eyes closed. Okay. And then from yesterday, question? Yes? Um, when it comes to like teaching the red words, is there a list? Like you know how like in our book we have like the scope and sequence? Is there a scope and sequence? There is. <laughs> There's a list. There sure is. Great question. Okay, so the the page that that is on is on your schedule, and it is in uh, page forty-seven to forty-nine.
it's in this book. Now, you notice they have these in alphabetical order. Um, it isn't necessarily easiest to hardest. They're alphabetical order. So you as a team might want to say, okay, I think these are the first grade words we're going to work on and the second grade words, etc. cetera. Um, then on the next page, it has groups that you can teach together. Once only in one, so you could teach those. I probably would not do all three of them in one day. I would do once one day, one another day, and um, only the next. Could, would, and should. I have a great visual for this that I will send to TJ so that she can send it, give it to you tonight. Um, could, would, and should. We've got this dog who's a very happy dog because he has a bone bigger than he is or she is. You might want to write down this name, JB Games. She has all sorts of wonderful OG games. She's an OG tutor out of Canada. Um, she also gives freebies from time to time, and this was a freebie. So for could, would, and should, you hear the W in would, you hear the K in could, and you hear the SH in should. The tricky letters in all four of those, three of those words, are the letters O-U-L-D. So her mnemonic and picture that she came up with was the O stands for O, the U like we would write it in a text, the L for lucky, and the D for dog. So you can teach them how to spell three words. I do these three together almost all the time, and I show them this um, picture, and they're like, oh, that's cool, I get it. <laughs> so it's oh, you lucky dog for could, would, and should. And then for the other ones, the two, two, and two, those are the three different twos. Again, I would not do all those on one day, but I would do them, you know, one maybe Monday, one on Wednesday, one on Friday, give a little time between it. But they did group some together. And then um, this non fond word list B is the next list, which is a little bit more challenging, as you can see. You can also search online Orton Gillingham Red Word List. There are all sorts of varieties of them. <laughs> there is a woman named Emily Gibbons. I personally love her stuff. And it's the literacy nest, nest, that's exactly right. And she sends free stuff all the time. Um, the literacy nest by Emily Gibbons. She sends um, decodables, decodable books. I've gotten several uh, stories that she has actually written. I've gotten several of those this week from her. So she has freebies. She also has things you can buy. Of course, um, she also does lots of different little workshops, but I really like what she puts out there and says and does. It's good stuff. I actually learned about a couple of fabulous virtual tour uh, tools from her website. Kate, I learned about that one I was telling you about today that I shared with you from her or her, her uh, website that or all the people that were on her website. Okay, now what I want you to do is be on page 94 in your Orton Gillingham supplemental document. Those are how do we introduce a new red word. And then you will notice on your schedule, we're going to do a partner practice. One teacher is going to introduce the word said and another one the word they. You can pretend that you have, the person introducing said, can pretend they've already learned, taught AI, says A, and then you can talk about why that's a red word. And the person introducing um, they, you can say that you've already taught EY, says E, so that you can explain why that's a red word. Okay, you probably will, really never would have taught those skills on those basic words, but just so that you get that practice today, I want you to do that. Any questions? 
Nope. Zoom questions? Nope. All right. So what do we have down here? Uh, Ten minutes. I don't think it'll quite take that long, but go ahead and get with your partner and practice those. Hello. <laughs> okay, I'm always sitting in here going, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. Okay, so I wanted to show you, um, so there's one more visual in here. That's, oh, you lucky duck. It's not the dog, but it's a duck, and you already have it. So it's in this book, The Educator's Guide, on page 181. What a delightful duck, okay? Um, just in case you were looking for the, oh, you lucky dog, I know that TJ said she'll send She'll send that out at the end of the day if you prefer the dog to the duck. Okay, um, looking on your supplemental book, page 94, there's all the steps. There's basically five steps, right? Sh show the word, use it in a sentence. Then they write it, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, three times. You can do that sky writing. You can do that in sand, um, in a little sand tray. You can do a little rice tray. You can do cross stitch. You can do, there's a million. I'm happy to send more of those ideas later if that would be helpful. Just send me a message. Um, so you sh show it, say it in a sentence. Have them write it in some kind of multi-sensory format. Have them write it on paper. Both of those three times. Close your eyes and sky write it. And then um, try to do it from memory. Okay? If you miss one of those pieces, don't stress out. All those steps will be given to you. They're all on this paper in kind of paragraph form, and they're also going to be on your lesson plan template. Okay, we'll head into your breakout rooms and practice introducing the word said and the word they. Okay, catch you on the flip side. <laughs> Okay, so we had a great question out here on they, and that was, why is that a red word? Because you learned this morning that the vowel team, E-Y, makes a sound of E and A. Excellent question. You guys keep us on our toes. I love it. <laughs> the reason that we call it a red word is this is a word that we would introduce probably in first grade. I know it's in, all my, le it's in my lessons in the beginning of first grade. They are not going to learn that EY says A at the beginning of first grade. They're going to learn that much later on. So it's a word they need because it's in a lot of their reading. So I'm going to teach it as a red word, memory word, etc. Okay? And then someone on Zoom asked, so if the word were were and I was, they were writing it the first time, would it be a good idea to cover up this as their brain takes a picture of it and then do this and then this and then this, where they're only saying the letters, not the sounds? For a student who has visual spatial problems, I would definitely do that. And you're going to have children in your classroom that have that difficulty looking at, from their seat up to the board. So I would do that to help them isolated. I'm not going to say the sound of the letter though because it's a red word and it's not making its fair sounds. I would say W and they would say W E R E. So I'm giving the letters and they're saying the letters. We never try to finger spell red words. We never try to sound red words out because they simply don't follow the rules. Okay? Okay, I had a Zoom question of, so in this particular lesson that you saw yesterday, the red word were was being introduced, which I just did, 
And then the question was, do you go through the known Redward deck? Yes. So you'll notice it says um, deck, the one only once, two, four, do, and does. So I have, I just keep making these cards. I keep adding to them. And then at the end, after I've, I've introduced the new word, I just put these words down and they read them. Let's go. Whoops, let's go, Christy, let's get, let's go. What's that say? Let's see if you remember the new one that I just taught you today. Four. Good job. So you do go through those, and this deck just keeps getting bigger. Now what I do is once they have read them ten times correctly, and I put stars on the back, then they retire them. For little kids, you kind of have to explain what retire is. One of my kids says, does that mean you die? I said, well, I sure hope not. <laughs> I hope I don't die when I retire. <laughs> Not for a long time. I've worked too hard to die. Um, so I explain how when you retire, you just go away for a little bit and do your own thing. And sometimes you get bored, and so you come back in to work for and do different things. And sometimes these retired words show back up, and we're going to go through those retired words again just to be sure they're still in your brain. And when I retire, I may go take a lot of days off work and then go back in just to be sure I keep my skills up. But I'll never forget. Does that mean you die? <laughs> mm, hopefully not. <laughs> All right. Any other questions on red words out there? Any Zoom questions? Okay. All right. So our next thing is schwa. Let me see your hand if you know about schwa. Ooh, that's a good number. Good. Very often, I'm, no one knows about schwa, so I'm super excited that some people know about it. And I love to tell my students when I introduce schwa to them, which is usually, well, when they're in second grade. I say, you know, I teach teachers, and a lot of teachers don't know what schwa is. They're like, really? And I said, yeah, now you can go back and show your teacher. Okay, so let's turn to page um, 13 in... Jordan Gillingham, Educator's Manual. And they like to call it, in this book, the third sound. Third vowel sound, which is the schwa sound. And really, the schwa sound sort of changes depending upon where you're from. Um, I remember doing this training with a teacher who was from Chicago, and the way I was saying a word, she said, I don't say that word that way at all. I don't hear a schwa vowel in it. And it's true. Depending upon what your dialect is, your, the schwa vowel is going to change, or you might not even hear it. Okay, so this particular book talks about the schwa making the uh sound. So if you look at the word daffodil, and then we, over here, it's daffa. We don't say, that's an open syllable. We don't say daffodil. I love to pick daffodils. We say daffodil. And some people say daffodil. They make the I sound there. So this book only talks about the schwa vowel sound making the uh sound. I think particularly for we Hoosiers, it also makes the I sound. Like say the word G-E-T. Get. Did you make an E or an I? Get. Go get it. I make an I sound there, which would be the E making the schwa sound of I in get. Um, this little upside down E here, you have a card for that. And it's card 74 in your blending deck. Once I taught schwa, I would pull this up and I explain to kids, this is what it would look like in the dictionary. If you looked up the word daffodil, it's going to have the short mark above the A. And for the O, it's going to have an upside down E telling you that that's going to be the schwa sound, the uh or the I sound. And then it's going to have the short mark over the I. Okay, so when we get to syllable division tomorrow, this is just a sneak into that. I tell kids when they come to a word and it doesn't work as an open syllable, I'll say, try it schwa. Daffodil. 
instead of daffodil. If you've never heard of a daffodil, try that second syllable schwa, daffodil. Try it open, try it schwa. It can also be in closed syllables. Try it closed, try it schwa. So let me give you some more examples. I'll give, actually, I'll give you some more examples in a minute. Let me go through um, the next page, 14. It says, what does a schwa sound like? It's very similar to the short sound U. Uh. So can everybody say uh? It's slightly different. We are not going to go on and on with the kids about that. We're just going to say it makes the short sound of uh. I would also suggest that you add, it can also say I, because in Indiana, it can. Um, if you look at the word about, that first A is schwa, it's saying uh, and a lot of times when a word begins with an A, it's going to be schwa. We don't say about, it's about 10, we say about, try right? it, schwa. Away. We don't say I went a way, I went away. So very often if an a begins or ends a word, it will be the schwa. Um, and the word the, the e is making the schwa sound, the. Now we teach that as a red word. Okay, some interesting facts about schwa. It's the only phoneme with its own name. This is the thing that, uh, that got me when I first started teaching. It is the most common vowel sound in the English language. Why is it the most common? Because every vowel makes a schwa sound. So if every vowel can make the uh or the is sound, there's a lot of words out there that have that schwa in it. Um, we already talked about how it's in the dictionary. It looks like an upside down E. Um, all the vowels, I just said, can be used to spell the schwa sound. And it comes from the ancient Hebrew word, which means emptiness or no vowel sound. Okay. You've got some more examples here, and then I, I put some examples on here for you of the schwa. So here we have a way. We have three A's in banana. B. Nan, that's making the short sound, uh, uh, ba, nan, uh. So those are my two schwas. Now here's my o, oh, bot, that's making the short o sound, tim. Or some people say tum, bottom. I say bottom, bottom. So there's your o oh, making the schwa sound. Here's your e making the schwa sound. Prob lim. How do you say it? Do you say um or m? Problem. Raise your hand if you say uh for the e, the schwa. Raise your hand if you say i. Okay. It is a dialect thing. And here we have the i making it. An a mole. Animal. So there's the i making the schwa sound. How do you say it? Do you say it as a uh, an a uh, mole? So when we get into syllable division, we'll talk more about this tomorrow. This is a closed, this is closed, and this is closed, so it should say an m all. Never heard of an animal. We'll try this second syllable schwa, animal. Okay, it's an animal. So try it closed, try it schwa. It will come in both closed and in open syllables because it's all your single vowel sounds that make the a uh sound. I didn't get one with you because the U, whenever it schwa's, it's going to say uh. <laughs> um, and it's just that slight little difference. It's, I'm not going to get into the students. Oh, well, that's schwa. It's not short U. Who cares? It says uh. <laughs> Question? I see a hand up back there. Yes. Animal, I feel like the schwa's on the second A. Animal. Um, and. Animal. Oh, oh, oh. I think you got a good point there. I think we might have two that are schwad. Animal. Because AL should say all. So you're right. I think both of those are saying it. The I and the A. Because uh, I don't say it's animal. I say animal. So I see two schwas in there. But again, it is dialect. And your student might say it differently. Good catch.
any other thing about schwa? Yes. I know one thing that I learned about the schwa is it's usually on the unaccented syllable. It is usually on the accented syllable. That's right. So let me go into that a little bit. Okay, accent. How do you find out it's on the unaccented syllable? Well, we're going to have some strange dogs names here, okay? Because I learned this, that you call your dog when you're trying to figure out which syllable gets more accent or stress, okay? So one of my dog's names is Sophie. So if I called her, I would put my hand here and I would be like I'm calling my dog. Sophie! So everybody do that with me. Sophie! Okay, where did your chin drop the most? Sophie! That's the accented syllable. The one where it didn't drop, fee, is your unaccented syllable. Okay, so let's try away and see where your chin drops. And we're, we're calling our dog. Our dog is strange na strangely named away. Away! Away! Which one? Way. So there we are on the unaccented syllable that's making the schwa sound. Let's try this one. Banana. Which one goes down the furthest? Nan. Banana. That's my dog, banana. <laughs> And these other two are unaccented, so they're going to be schwa. Does that make sense? You guys are not going to forget these strange names for dogs, are you? <laughs> Next time you get a dog, you're going to think, oh, well, maybe I'll call it away. <laughs> or banana. And I'll work on that schwa while I'm doing it. <laughs> okay, any other questions or comments from the group? Anything online? Nope. Okay, now everybody knows about schwa. And we'll talk tomorrow about um, when we divide syllables and flexing between. Um, a couple years ago, my, um, my oldest daughter lives in Chicago in Wicker Park, and we were walking around. She always used to say, we're going to this restaurant six blocks away. Everything was always six blocks away, but it was like three miles away. <laughs> and uh, we passed a restaurant, and it looked like a dump and was called Schwa. <laughs> and I said, does that mean it's empty? But anyway, when I went back home and checked, it was like a very famous restaurant with a very famous chef. So Schwa in Wicker Park. <laughs> anyway, I, I didn't get it. but. Um, I'm going to talk to you now about um, teaching kids how to spell multisyllable words, okay? And this is something that you will do with kids. I'm going to get a darker marker, darker marker, who understand um, syllables. And you've done a lot of counting of syllables, and you've done a lot of um, talking about syllable types. So this is not anything new. Because this process of teaching them how to spell multisyllabic words um, is kind of hinging on the fact that they understand syllables. So what you would do is you would give the child the first word. And I chose this word specifically because it's two close syllables. And the sounds are pure. There's no schwa. And you've got to make sure that it doesn't have a schwa sound when you begin. That we'll, we're going to kind of edge into that. And the first word class that we're going to spell is kidnap. What is it? Kidnap. Let's see how many syllables that is. Put your hand underneath your chin. Kidnap. How many syllables? Two. two. It is two. Exactly. So we're going to make two lines on our paper. Okay, because that's two syllables. Kid nap. All right? Now we're going to fingerspell the first syllable. What was that first spell syllable again? Kid. It is kid. Let's fingerspell that. K I D. Very good. So let's write it down. You're going to make sure you're um, kind of saying it under your breath. K I D. Remember the word is kidnap, and you oftentimes have to repeat that because they might forget that second syllable. It's kidnap. Now, what's the second syllable? What is it, class? Nap. Let's fingerspell nap. 
N a p. Very good. A p. And this word is what? Okay, the second word that we're going to do is another word that is going to be um, two closed syllables. It's nutmeg, and you might think they might know, not know the spice, but if you know soccer, what a nutmeg is in soccer. You put it between somebody's legs, so. I don't look like a soccer player, do I? Um, anyway, it's nutmeg. What is it? Nutmeg. Very good. And um, the first syllable is? Okay, we're going to put the lines because it's nutmeg. Let's fingerspell nut together. Ready? N -a -t. Now, sub vocalize as you go. N -a -t. Okay, and the, the word is nutmeg. What's the second syllable? Meg. Meg. Okay, let's fingerspell that. M -e -g. Go ahead. M -e -g. Nutmeg. Very good. So that's an example of how you start with two closed syllables because it's kind of the easiest thing. And then you kind of ease into some different things. We're going to do um, the word silent. Let's go ahead and feel how many syllables silent is. Silent. Very good. It's two syllables. Let's make our two lines. And let's say the syllables again. It's going to be si Lent. Okay, the first syllable is psi. What kind of syllable do you think that is? It's an open syllable, exactly. So let's go ahead and fingerspell psi. Psi. And then you're going to have The word is silent. So what's the second syllable? Lent. This is a little tricky. Let's see if we can do it. Lent. That is an ending blend, one sound on each finger. Ooh, eh, mm, t. Okay, so what kind of syllable is this? Open. Open. And what is this? Closed. Okay. Um, I'm going to do one more that's kind of clear cut, and this is a compound word. I love these. Pork chop. What is it? Pork chop. Pork chop. How many syllables? Pork chop. Okay. Pork chop. Let's finger, finger spell the first part, which is pork. Ready? P pork. All right. P pork. Very good. The second part in pork chop is chop. Ch ah. Put it together. There we go. Now, what kind of syllable is this? Are controlled. And what kind of syllable is this? Close. Close. Good job. Um, now, you kind of get into some difficulty when you get into words that have a schwa sound. And um, this is why we do it this way. And this is very helpful for kids. You got to figure out a way for them to remember. When I was like in third grade or second or third grade, my teacher was teaching us how to spell the word Wednesday. And she said, it's like this, Wednesday. I don't know how many, that's what I, I still do today. That's how I spell it. And what you're going to do is you're going to pronounce it like it would be if you were reading it um, phonetically correct, okay? So I would say this word is problem, but we, it's Problem. Let's feel that. Problem. How many syllables is that? Two. Two. The first syllable in prob problem is what? Prob. prob. So we're going to finger spell it. P R A B. There's that blend with the P and the R on two different. P -r okay. Lem. Problem. Let's finger spell it. L -e -m. Now, that is the way that you do that when you have a schwa sound. Um, I'm going to do another one that has three syllables because I know that's the next question coming off Zoom. 
this word is Atlantic. Ready? Let's see how many syllables. Atlantic. How many? Three. three. So we're going to make three lines this time. And this is a special word because it's the name of an ocean. So what are we going to have to start it with? Okay, remember that. So this is the, um, in Atlantic. What's the first syllable? At. At. Let's do it. At. At. Oh, I got to remember my capital. I got it. The next one in Atlantic is. Can you bring the whiteboard down, please? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Atlantic. What is the second syllable? Land. Land. Let's finger spell it. O A N. And the last one is tick, Atlantic. Let's go. T I C. This is tricky because I often tell, tell them that there's not going to be a C at the end of a word. But this is an instance where there's a C at the end of the word. So I'd probably tell them that. But that is a way to kind of ease into multisyllable words after they've had lots of practice on different kinds of syllables, lots of practice with um, uh, just finger spelling, and after a healthy dose of talking about um, schwa. Um, we spend a lot of time on schwa sound in third grade, particularly when you talk about A at the beginning. You, you know, most of the time it's going to be, uh, and so most of the kids were able to kind of figure that out. Instead of putting a U at the beginning, they put an A, because they knew that that was a schwa sound. So, does anybody have questions? Yes, we will get more into that. Ask if there is a uh, schwa could be its own syllable. So. so, I'm sorry, I think I, I'm zoned for a second. Is there a schwa in Atlantic? Because I don't hear it. We, are, we don't usually, Atlantic, Atlantic is what I say, Atlantic. Atlantic, Atlantic, oh, Atlantic, Atlantic. Well, a tick, we don't say Atlantic, it's tuck. Yeah, it could be, but to be, when you're having them practice spelling words, is doing it, kind of making the schwa. Um, one, I think one of the terms that came, that came to me that somebody says is a lot of times you just want to get it to their range of recognition, you know, and a lot of times they can take that on and figure it out on their own. Atlantic. Okay. Okay. I think we're on a break, right? Okay. Are we behind schedule? Oh, we're doing a party. Part. Sorry. You ca it, your, your brain becomes dead after a while, just dead. Okay, you're going to do a partner practice. There's some examples of some words right there. I'll go over the process one more time. You have, you tell the child, a uh, student, the word. You ask them how many syllables, and that's how many lines they make. Okay? Then you, you're making sure you're repeating the words lots because they might forget parts. You're going to say that first syllable says at. Let's fingerspell it. They fingerspell it. They subvocalize as they write it in. Then you repeat the word again. It's atlas or whatever. Okay? Fingerspell the second syllable then write it in, and let's say the word again, okay? All right. Hey, okay, I feel like I'm just sprinting today. Okay, um, so basically when you're introducing those multisyllabic words and you're spelling, you're going to tell the word, do the chin drop, to talk about how many syllables, that's how many lines they draw on their paper, right? And then repeat each chunk and have them finger spell each chunk and write it down as they go. So chunk by chunk, right? Syllable by syllable. Okay, are you ready? Teacher A is going to do robot, beyond, and market. Teacher B is going to do instruct, hero, and garden. 
Be careful on struct. Remember what we talked about with blends and how many fingers blends go on. Remember? Okay. All right, a um, couple things. I'm going to reiterate this. If it is a blend and you can hear both sounds, each sound gets, goes on its own finger. If it's a digraph, like shh, that's only one sound, so it goes on one finger. Okay? Okay, I had a great question about JB Games, and um, I. Googled it two different ways. If you Google JB Games Orton Gillingham, then you'll get her wonderful stuff. Um, she's got games, all sorts of games. Um, she has freebies. That's where I got, um, she's got some sight word mnemonics here. Um, that's where I got, oh, you lucky dog from her. Must not be on there anymore, but answer. She has a mnemonic, apes never swing with extra rope. <laughs> Above, a bakery opens very early. So she has different mnemonics for those. Um... Anyway, she's just got a bunch of good stuff, but again, $2 downloadable d digital games. I like $2. $2 is nice, all sorts of things there. Um, but again, put in OG, excuse me, JB Games, Orton Gillingham. Otherwise, you get other stuff. I don't know these people personally or any of that stuff. I don't benefit from this. I just want to share the good stuff I found out there through the years. <laughs> so there you go. And you're going to spell the R ones? Uh-huh. Okay. Okay. Questions about some of the multi-syllable words um, and the word market? It's mm are now we can go into some things with speech language people who says that's two sounds but we're saying are controlled one sound one finger mm are okay on one finger um, the other thing that was really uh, difficult for some people when we put it on there on um, purpose is the word instruct most syllables do not go over five sounds. Um, it is, and those are called complex syllables. Struct is an example of one that's six. So it'd be st, r, a, k, t, back to that first. We'd give it to a, a, a kid that's just learning. We just kind of threw it out there to blow your mind a little bit. Okay. Um, we're going to talk about stick vowels, and it wasn't until I was an older person that I knew this rule, and it kind of blew my mind like nobody told me this. But I was one of those kids um, that went to school during the 60s, and we got lists of words to memorize, and I was really good at that, so I was in the bluebird group. <laughs> Lucky you, I was in the pros. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Crows or vultures, you don't want to be in crows or vultures. Um, anyway, I, and there wasn't a whole lot of phonics taught, and I, it, this is ridiculous that we don't know this, and that is 
when C has an E, I, or Y after it, um, it says S. And that is so unbelievably consistent throughout um, English that when I see it and it doesn't follow through, it kind of bothers me. Um, my daughter played soccer with a girl whose name was Kirsten with a C-I. And that used to bother me so bad. <laughs> you can't do that. can't do that. But you can, and then we go through the whole thing as you can spell the na your name any way you want. So, all right. So this is the way you teach this. Um, I taught this. It's very, very effective. We're talking about stick vowels. Um, there is a, a card that looks like this in the supplementary doc, um, deck. I tell you, my mind's going and so is my mouth. It is S13 and it's got the stick vowels and I'll show you why. I would give the kids some, like, some sticks to use, Q-tips or um, <coughs> year before I let them come in and bring in a bunch of little sticks from recess, mm -hmm. which always things happen. Um, so I give them some sticks and I said, I want you to make with your sticks letters and I want you to see if you can make the E with it with with sticks and here I have it I have an E so E is considered a stick vowel just like in this card and then I say can you make I with a stick oh that's easy we're gonna make I okay and then I say can you make Y a stick with sticks gonna move it over here a little bit it doesn't and you make Y. I probably cut that off. So um, these are wiki sticks, which I'm not super familiar, but they're kind of cool. Um, but the kids, we're going to be building them and putting them on their desk. And we would say, OK, this is E, I, and Y, and those are stick vowels. We show them this card. It's going to be important. You always have one kid that says, hey, you can make with sticks, but don't tell them that. So anyway. Um, we say this is important because if a stick vowel comes after a C, it says S. Okay? Does everybody understand that? If a stick vowel comes after a C, it says S. When we learn this, then when I tap the cards, now I'm tapping it twice. You're going to say K and S when followed by a stick vowel, E, I, Y. Okay? You're going to say k, s, when followed by a stick vowel, e, i, y. And I make them repeat that because they need to remember, remember what the stick vowels are. This card goes with it. And it's a really cute picture. The cat, the k, the cat is saying s because there's stick vowels here, e, i, and y. Okay, then we are going to go on and talk about what happens when you have a G. G also says something different when followed by a stick vowel. It is not as consistent as the C saying S, and you're going to tell the kids that. It's very consistent with the C, but not with the G. So G would say G and j when followed by a stick vowel, e, i, y. Let's go ahead and say that. Go. G. And j when followed by a stick vowel, e, i, y. All right? So that's how you would then present the stick vowels and those particular different sounds for those cards, which give kids a lot of trouble. I know. The kids oftentimes see that G, and because it's kind of connected to the sound, the G, J, they want to say J first. But we're working on G. But when you teach them the stick vowel, they're going to say both. Okay, and here is the picture in the deck that's for, that's J Jeffrey the giraffe, and he's saying, he's being, um, saying J when followed by a stick vowel, E, I, Y. Okay? Um, okay, is there any question about stick vowels? 
that's a little rule that that's a nice compact way to teach the kids and have them remember. And um, like I said, it's very impactful. Okay. the opposite of that is, well, do you want to show it? Gentle Cindy in the Orton Gillingham Guide, I, there's a picture too in the Orton Gillingham book, which is not that one, <laughs> it's this one, with, uh, and there's this picture that you can put up on your wall, it's Gentle Cindy. It's little. Reminds me of that girl. Have you ever seen that movie, The Bad Seed? Yes. It's a little creepy. Okay. <laughs> I think if I wear a headband, that's exactly what I look like. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. I don't have bangs. Okay. I'm getting slap happy now. So. Okay. okay. So we know three ways to spell k so far. What are they? Who can tell me what the three ways are? Yes. CK, K, and C. Mm -hmm. That's right. CK, K, and C. Where is this one? After a short vowel. After a short vowel, it's always going to come at the end of a word, right? So once we have that, we're down to just these two letters to spell K. The C and the K. All right, so there's a rule on how you know whether you're going to use a C or a K. And you don't have to get it now, but you have a card, S71, to help with that. Okay, so we have this cute little picture of a cat, and the cat's eyes are made out of A, the nose out of an O, and the mouth out of a U. And then underneath it, it says other consonants. So the way this works is, I hear, I have a k sound. It's followed by an A, so I'm going to use the C, like in cat. I have a k sound. It's followed by an O, so I'm going to use the C to spell the k sound, like in cat. I have a U after my C. So I'm going to spell the k sound with a C, like in cat. Now I have a C, which is a consonant to spell the k sound. I'm spelling the k sound with a C. I'm sorry, because there's an A after it. Okay, in this one, in the word scratch, here's my k sound. I use a C because there's another consonant after it. So that's why I use the C. And the word scrub, here's my k sound. There's a consonant that comes after it. So I'm going to use a C. So when an A, O, U, or consonant comes after the sound of k, I use a C. So, now the other one is we can also spell the k with a k. This time there has to be an e, an i, or y after the sound of k to use a k. Okay, so here's my k sound. And I have my I. Here's my k sound. I'm going to use a K because there's my E. 
Here's the k sound, followed by a y, so I'm going to use a k. Here's my k sound. There's an e that comes after it, so that tells me I'm going to use a k. Here's a two-syllable word, pumpkin. Here's my k sound. I'm going to spell it with a k because of an i after it. Does that make sense? When I introduce this to the students, I start with one. And I start with the C. I don't know why, I just do. And I actually have them get some kinesthetic part going. And I have them, when there is an A, an O, or a U, or any consonant, after the k, I'm going to use a C, like in cat. And then I'll have them kind of close their eyes and imagine looking at those A's, the, the O and the U, that the, that the um, cat's face is made out of, so that they can really visualize that. And then, when it's time to spell them, let's put that right there. And if you would spell with me here, please. And I sh I'll demonstrate one before we actually do it. Okay, so if my word is skin, I tell the children, I go skin, sk. I'm not going to put my letter in there yet. I'm going to put a blank. I n. Okay, I have an I, so that tells me what letter am I going to use. I'm going to put a K in there, that's right. Okay, my next word is club. K -o -ub. I'm not going to put the letter because I'm not sure what it is yet. Uh -oh. -ub. Okay, what letter comes after the k sound? A consonant. So I'm going to use my C because that's A, O, or U or any other consonants. Does that make sense? But I always have them put a placeholder in there because they don't know what next, you know, they want them to see that next letter that's coming after it before they put it in. Okay, let's do another one. Scab. S-c-ab. S-c-ab. Okay, I have an A there, so I'm going to use my C. Kind of cool, isn't it? I love the cat and the kite. And I have to tell you, I learned this from Maggie. <laughs> she was my niece's best friend when my niece was little. My niece I told you about on the first day of training, who's in her 30s now. And you know you're kind of getting old when you knew this girl when she was this high and she comes to your teacher training. <laughs> Maggie came to my teacher training and she is the one that taught me that rule and she taught kindergarten at the time and she said she had a big cat and a big kite up on her bulletin board and I said okay Maggie um, I'm big barn and stealing that one from you <laughs> so that is a wonderful one for when you use a C and when you use a K to spell K. based upon I'm going to see if anybody can figure this out I hope it doesn't make your brain explode. But based upon what Jamie just told you about the stick vowels, why would you have to use a K instead of a C? What would happen if you used a C? What would it, it, would, have, it would say this sound, that's right. And we wanted to say the K sound. Good job. You guys are so on it. So impressive. <laughs> you are a great, great group. Can you repeat the answer to that question? Sure. The answer was, I said, based upon what Jamie just taught you about stick vowels, which were the E, I, and Y make a C say the sound of S. We're going to have to use a K to make the k sound before an e, i, or y, because if we put a c there, it wouldn't say k, 
it would say <laughs> if you if that's not processing in your brain quite yet don't worry about it because these two rules came at you pretty darn quick it may work for some of you and your others you might be thinking hmm don't worry about it just teach it as two separate things and I would never tell the kids that um, of what I just shared with you and then someday you'll go ah I know what she was talking about now <laughs> What'd you say? You wouldn't have skin, you'd have sin. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Okay, so we have now, well, first of all, are there questions on the C, when you use C to spell K and when you use K to spell K? Okay, tell me, when do we use C to spell the K? What letters? A. An A, there's three letters, A, O, U, or any consonant. And when do we use the K to spell the sound of K? What letters come after? E, I, and Y. E, I, and y. Okay, now, we have a part, oh, any Zoom questions? Okay, we have a partner practice. Um, and what we're going to do is one of you is going to teach the C versus the K with those words that are right there. So you will have them like put the line. First, you're going to teach the rule using this card, which is S71. And then you're going to have them practice using that rule um, by spelling those words. And the line stands for the K sound. And then the other partner is going to teach the stick vowel rule. Okay? Jamie, what card number was that stick vowel rule? Probably comes right by S71. What is it? S13, 14, 15. Okay. One of you is going to teach um, C versus K, and one of you is going to do the stick vowel. So if you, if you happen to have your supplemental deck, um, the stick vowel and then the C and the G card are S13, S14, and S15, if you have those. Um, and the cat kite rule is S71. If you're curious, you know there's a silly little rhyme on the back <laughs> because that's how my brain works and that's how some kids' brains work. If that helps you, feel free to use them. If not, don't worry about it. Okay, one person's going to teach cat kite and one person's going to teach stick vowels. Okay, if you would turn in this um, supplemental documents to page 113, I want you to add a letter here. This is the same picture, just done a little differently. This is by Jamie. Um, the A, the O, and the U. Um, but the, the Y is missing here, so would you just add a Y? I thought, you know, you might be looking at this sometime and think, I thought there was supposed to be a Y there. Where would that Y go? Yeah, it's on that, this is just a different portrayal of your picture. But if you could just put the Y there in case you look at it later and go, what happened to that Y? I thought there was a Y. I don't want it to confuse you. <laughs> that would be me. I'd be like, what? There isn't a Y? Okay, Miss Jamie, take it away with morphology. Sit back and relax. <laughs> Or buckle in. <laughs> buckle in, yeah, I was like. <laughs> okay. In, in um, your, they like us to show the front, the book with the Marion thing, it has a PowerPoint that I put in there that's on page 114. It looks like this. 
It actually looks like that. Okay. When we talk about morphology, we're talking about the study of morphemes. Okay, and we'll talk about here is on my PowerPoint. So we're talking about morphology, the study of. Ology means study of. Okay, I'm going to try this. The smallest unit of meaning is a morpheme. We have the word cat. That's one morpheme. It means a cat. But we're going to add another morpheme to it to change the meaning. I put an S. A S means more than one, so that is two morphemes. Cat with the S. It is, um, this is just a quote that you can look at later that talks about how studying morphology helps kids in a couple of different ways. It helps them to understand how words go together. They under, begin to understand um, vocabulary and it helps them to break words apart. Um, so it, it developed word consciousness, which means improving spelling, decoding, and vocabulary. This is an upper grade um, type thing. And if you did um, advanced Orton, this is what you would get into. Um, until I studied this about five years ago and went to some workshops, I had no idea about this. But I'm going to tell you that you are going to be presenting some morphemes to younger kids because it needs to be done. Okay? Talking about morphology, you can't go ahead and have a study of morphology unless you have a study of the layers of English language. Because England was invaded so many times, there are so many different words that come from different languages, and it, that's why English is so difficult, because you have to understand that some of these words come from different languages. We had um, the Anglos and the Jutes and the um, Saxons at one time invading England, so we have Anglo-Saxon words or Old English, word, old English words. That's about 5% of English words. And then they got Latin, um, uh, began to do words that are Latin. And it used to be the people that were the um, rich people who were speaking Latin. And then some of our words come from Greek, about 5%. And those are math science words. I, I'm not going to say this is all that's in the English language. There's a lot of French. There's, when the Vikings invaded, they brought their own words. Um, but I'm just, this is very simplified about the layers of English language. And the more you know about, the more you can tell the kids. Um, etymology is the facts of the origin and development of a word. Um, this is really kind of fun. I taught, um, morphology in fourth grade when I taught fourth grade a couple years ago and the kids really liked the study of morphology when we got into some Latin and putting um, putting uh, prefixes and suffixes on words and they came they, they began to spell so much better and there was a certain understanding of what words meant if they understand what the uh, prefixes and suffixes and bases and roots meant as well Okay, Anglo-Saxon. Anglo-Saxon are everyday words, mother, farm, cow. Um, Anglo-Saxon words are the words that kids learn first. Unfortunately, they don't play fair because that's the one reason that you know. They've just changed over time. They are put together in a certain way. There's bases, prefixes, suffixes, or compound words. That's how you put together Anglo-Saxon Anglo words. OK, here's an example of building Anglo-Saxon words. I have some prefixes, um, bases, and suffixes. What I would like you to do is look at them and see if you can take a prefix, a base, and a suffix and make a word. 
and then just yell it out so we can see. Or you can get, come from um, Zoom. Beheaded. Forehead. Yeah. Say that again. Beheaded. Beheaded. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's one kids will come up with. Exactly. Say that again. Outstanding. Outstanding. Outsider. Outsider. Understanding. Understanding. Overdoer. Understanding. Overdoer. Anything else? Inside. Anything from uh, Zoom? No, they're not into it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they're watching. Outstanding. Outstanding. They're watching their shows right now. <laughs> okay. Overdue. We're gonna go overdo. You know, overdo. Overdoing. That's. I'm kind of overdoing it right now. <laughs> okay. Latin is nice to teach older kids because it's phonetically regular. Um, about 50% of words of the words in the dictionary of Latin origin, they have bases with prefixes and suffixes. That's how they put their words together. And you can tell a Latin word if it has an ending blend like PT and CT. Always the base keeps the accent and, and um, the affixes have the schwa sound in Latin words. We're going to go on. Here is a common Latin root, struct in the middle. It means to build. Can you give me a word? Construction. Construction. Very good. Destruct. Destruct. <laughs> Um, destructive. Constructing. Constructed. Instructed. We should all know that. <laughs> Structure. Is Re this? The that struct right there can't stand by itself. There are some Latin roots that can stand by themselves now, but we're, but in this instance, struct cannot stand by itself. It's called a um, bound, uh, a bound morpheme, and it needs either a prefix or a suffix, or both, to be a word. Okay. Greek are, are math and science words. What I like about Greek is the meaning is pretty pure. You, they have. Basically, they do have prefixes and suffixes because things have changed. But basically, they have combining forms. And that means it's almost like a compound word. You take two combining forms and put them together. And both of them can carry the meaning and the accent. Greek words have all of those unusual spellings. P.S. at the beginning with a silent P. R.H. rheumatism. P-H, P-T with a silent P, and Y is a vowel is often a Greek word, and C-H saying K is Greek. So if you look at the word psychology, you have, you have three right there. Um, the P-S with a silent P, um, I, I did this, this slide and I said, now I know how to spell psychology, I just remember this. Um, and the Y, um, with borrowing the I sound and the CH saying K. So that's psychology, and those are all those gr great math science words. If you come up with another, you know, math sciencey word, oftentimes you just take some Greek combining forms and throw them together, and it's a new word. Okay, we're going to make some Greek words. Ology means the study of. Tell me a word that has ology in it. Biology. 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 Geology. 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 Physiology. Technology. Technology. These are pretty straightforward. We know it's a study of. Um, and then we have graph, which means to write or record. I tell the kids, like a photograph. I mean, like a phonograph. And they went, what's that? And um, so give me a word that has graph in it. Autograph. 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 Paragraph. Paragraph. Telegraph, back, back in the old days. So we have. Um, P-H-Y-S, phys, meaning nature. Any words? Physical. Physical. Physiology. Physiology. Physics. Physics. <coughs> okay. And my favorite, which is phobia, and I always start 
my lessons on Greek words with phobia, and then we look them up on the internet. I tried this the first time, and there were some really strange phobias that I had to say, ooh, let's not go to that page. Um, and which means irrational fear. Do you have an idea of one? Arachnophobia. Arachnophobia. Mm -hmm. It's irrational fear. I tell the kids, it's okay to be afraid of stuff, but we're afraid of something that's irrational because I'm afraid of little birds. That's irrational. So I can't remember. I, I used to know what that was, that kind of fear. It's, it comes from seeing the, the movie The Birds at a young age. Yeah, it could be. Or, ornith, ornith, yeah. I think it is. Awesome. So that is an idea of word origin and how that informs us doing morphology with kids. Um, what I would do with the kids, I'm just going to go quickly over this, is that I would present them with a Latin, um, a Latin base or root, spect, which means to see, and then I'd have them brainstorm, and I'm just going to show you some words that they would come up with. Inspect, inspector, inspection, reinspect, and inspecting. And then we're going to do the EX, expect, expected, unexpected, expectation. And then they're going to do R, E, respect, respectful, disrespectful, respectfully, and respected, respecting. Um, this, is, this is a little bit of an example of another way to get kids to brainstorm words that contain a particular Latin um, a Latin root, and this is called a, a matrix, and um, it is, I would give that to the kids and say, you have to start from the left and go through the, to the right and see how many words you can make using these prefixes and suffixes, okay? And I'm going to show you something right here because this is sometimes a little confusing. Let me go. Um, we have the, let's say we put this Latin root right here, which is struct, and I wanted to say instruction, it's really I-O-N that you put at the end. And what happens is when that T-I gets together, it makes the sound shh, and then the rest is swa schwad, okay, shun. And the same thing is with U-R-E, when you put it together, it says chur, okay? And they, for some reason, they buy that, so. Um, but you have to, when they see how these words go together, you can understand why spelling them becomes, becomes tons easier because, um, it's just if they know prefixes and suffix and they go together, and this one is, it, it, it's just, ooh, I gotta switch. Okay. All right. Um, one of the things that I do when I'm teaching um, morphology is I do something called word sums. And what I tell the kids is have you ever heard the word sums before? And they said, oh, in addition. I said, Word sums is when you take word parts and you put them together and make a new word. We're going to get more into this tomorrow. I'm going to have a whole section on that. But that's just an example of I would give them a word like reenactment and they would be able to break those apart. And can you imagine the ability to break a word like that apart would help them read that? Okay? And spell it. Um, okay, that's the, that's the end of that one. Okay, I am going to talk to you about um, what we have in, in English, okay? This is important. If we looked at prefixes, words that have prefix or prefixed words, these happen the most. So it's important that you teach these four prefixes to the end, okay? They happen the most, 
And if it, it, look at the list of prefixed words. 95% of prefixed words use these prefixes. Okay? And I'm going to talk to you about how to teach those in a second. If you look at suffixed words, 97% of them use ed, ly, ing, s, and es. So you can see how these can be something that you're going to emphasize most all because they're going to come across it most often. All right. When I was teaching morphology, morphology, and I didn't get to it third grade because of COVID, blah, blah, blah. Um, but when I teach morphology in fourth grade, I'm going to kind of tell you how I went about it. I started with just some prefixes and suffixes. I spent a couple of weeks just building up a little reservoir of prefixes and suffixes and what they meant. Okay. And when you are teaching, let me do this one. When you are teaching a, I think there's, yeah. when you're teaching a prefix, you don't say it says re. It says it says re. Because when it goes onto a word, it changes sounds in many cases. If you look at con, it can be um, conniving or it can be, um, I'm, now I can't think of any words. It, it has different sounds. We're going to teach it this way. This is R-E. R-E means back and again. It was what kind of uh, one kind well, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, that's prefix. So that would be one that I would teach pretty early. Back and again. Okay. This means, this is S, and it means more than one. I would make sure that they knew it is a prefix and a suffix. Now, she has a little, she made the little cards with the little lines so that I think they're going to be, they're going to realize their prefixes or suffix because of the little lines. The cards I had before, they didn't have lines, so they had to tell me whether it was a prefix or suffix. Okay. So I'm just going to go through the card deck that I have here. There are, um, from 16 to 54 are prefixes and suffixes. I'm just going to go over a few of them so you can see how a card deck was, is going to go because you're going to have a separate card deck for your prefixes and suffixes. You, they are going to have to tell you if it's a prefix, a suffix, and if it's a suffix, they're going to say it's a vowel suffix or a consonant suffix. And you will find out why later. But it's important whether it's a vowel suffix or a consonant suffix, meaning and an example word. All right, so we have first one is ly. And ly means in a way that is. She has them on the back, so you don't even have to look. In a way that is. And then I would say to the class, give me an example word. Give me an example word. Give me an example word. Because that's the important thing, attaching it to a word and knowing what that word is and when to use that. So it's going to be L-Y. It's a vowel, I mean a consonant suffix. It means in a way that is. I-S-H is a suffix. It's a vowel suffix. It means like or relating to. And an uh, example word is what? Pinkish. Pinkish. Foolish. Foolish. Exact, exactly. UN is a prefix. It means not or the opposite. Give me an example word. Unwrap. Say that again. Unwrap. Unwrap. Unknown. Unhappy. Sub is a, I'm sorry, I said sub. S-U-B is a prefix. It means down or secondary. Give me an example word. Submarine. 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 Subway. Subterranean. Subterranean. Sub-zero. Okay. I-N-G is a 
suffix. It is a vowel suffix. It means happening now. Give me an example word. Calling. Calling. Sleeping. 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 Eating. Eating. Oh, my favorite thing. <laughs> okay. D-E is a prefix. It means down or away. An example word is depress, deflate. Um, I told the story of a couple years ago when I was teaching that we had this big controversy where this girl pulled another girl's pants down. And our example word was always depantsed. <laughs> down and away. Got it? It was a very good visual for them. Okay. S is a suffix. Um, it means more than one. Give me an example. Cats. Dogs. Margaritas. Okay. <laughs> All right. RE is a prefix. It means back or again. Go ahead and give me an example word. Remind. 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 Review. Redo. Redo. Okay? So that's how you would do a, a deck with prefixes and suffixes. Um, I should have gotten to some of these um, this year in third grade, but kind of time got away with me. So I didn't get to them, but I, I did a real in extensive study of morphology when I was teaching fourth grade. And um, I'm going to tell you an example of, we, did, we had spelling lists and we studied a different um, Latin root every week. We did tract, which means to drag or pull. Notice it has that ending blend of CT, and our words were tractor, retract, uh, yeah, tract. I, I wish I could think right now, but I can't. Then we had struct, which means to build, and there's lots of things, structure and instruct, etc. Then we did form, which means form or shape, and it's inform and reform. Reform is to shape again. Um, we did ject, which means to throw, inject, throw it in your arm, or reject, you know, throw back, subject. And we, I don't think we did subject. Subject. Sometimes it's not real clear where, the, where that goes, but it gives them an idea. Port is to carry, import and export. Um, cyst, one of my favorite, which means to stand, resist, insist, um, rupt is to break, interrupt to break, rupture. rupture, sect means to cut or divide, um, dissect, <laughs> that's the one I always remember. Cred, which is a really cool one, which means to believe. Credentials, Credentials and, uh, you know, credit. And spect would be one which means to see. Inspect, spectator. spectacles, spectator. So those are examples of how you could use Latin, um, Latin roots to teach spelling. And I'm going to tell you, it's amazing how well those kids could read words that had these particular um, Latin roots, and they understood all of the prefix and suffixes and how to put them together. OK? All right. I'm th I think we're, oh, there's a question. OK. Yeah. Um, we asked, are these in the sequence? And some nope. of the prefixes and suffixes you mentioned are in the spoken yeah. sequence, but um, yeah, so, uh, somebody wanted to know whether these were in the scope and sequence. No, they are not. I will send you these. I think I didn't send them last week, but the, the other week I did send them. Um, this is just me that I came up with. And it, just to give you a little, um, to give you a little idea of 
how you can move on from this or how you can work on some things at a higher level with kids. And you're gonna, you'd probably have to get some more training or some more investigation <coughs> on how to do this. It's just like an extension here. Um, so you got to listen to me. I do think that it's important that you do make sure you have prefixes and suffixes in your teaching from kindergarten on. You know, what does an S mean? It means it changes the meaning of the word. Those are the kinds of things that you put, and I do believe all of those are in, prefix and suffixes are in the scope and sequence. So that would, that's where I'd start, okay? Any other questions? I have a clarification. Certainly. You mentioned vowel and consonant suffixes. Is that the same for prefixes that I missed? No, nope, you don't have to worry about that. You have to remember if it's a, you have to be aware whether it's a vowel suffix or a consonant suffix when you're talking about suffix adding rules. Okay. So that's why you do it. Like not doubling the T. Yeah, yeah. And you, you'll see that tomorrow when we talk about suffix adding okay. rules. So that's the fun we have planned for you tomorrow. Okay. Okay, any other questions? Okay. Anybody? <laughs>